Welcome back to the Mindful Hunter Podcast. My name is Jay Nickel. Welcome back to the Mindful Hunter Podcast. I am your host, as always, Jay Nickel. And the guest on today's podcast is a bit of a mentor of mine, although he probably doesn't know he was a mentor of mine. When I first got into hunting, kind of back into hunting, I was living in the Lower Mainland and I got obsessed with chasing blacktails. And there is not a lot of information on Pacific Northwest blacktail hunting. I'm not talking Oregon. I'm not talking California. I'm talking legit coastal ghost Pacific Northwest blacktails. And if you know anything about blacktails, then you know who Steve Isdall is. He goes under the name ProGuide66 on Instagram and on the Hunt BC forum. And he is, I think it's safe to say, the most accomplished blacktail hunter on the coast. And I've wanted to talk to this guy since I started my podcast. And I was finally able to connect and make it happen. And it was nothing short of my expectations. He shared an unbelievable amount of information. It's a fairly lengthy podcast. We had a fantastic chat about all kinds of different hunting, his background. It was just, it was a privilege and an honor. And we're going to get him back on here again. He's got a book coming out in the near future. And when that comes out, we'll have him back on. We'll talk through the book and we'll get some more hunting tips from him. It was, yeah, it definitely did not disappoint. So I think you guys are going to get a lot of value out of this conversation. Steve doesn't do a whole lot of public engagement like podcasts and stuff. So, and I will say like, Steve can come off a little full on online sometimes. And I actually like that about him, but I was a little intimidated going into this one. And he was the nicest easiest going, most down to earth guy, super willing to share information, just a passionate hunter who wants to help other hunters succeed. And I deeply appreciate the time that he took. Now, quick bit of housekeeping. I launched Forged in the Backcountry last week. This is a lifestyle apparel brand for backcountry hunters, some kick-ass t-shirts, hoodies, flannels, caps, all kinds of stuff. If you're interested, go to Forged in the Backcountry Dot com. Until April 16th, every $5 you spend will get you one entry to win a guided black bear hunt in British Columbia. I will be going with you on the hunt, I will film the hunt, and it will go up on the Mindful Hunter YouTube channel. All you got to do is get yourself to Prince George and back. I will take care of everything else. Transportation to the lodge, hunt fees, tip. You just got to worry about your taxidermy and your travel to and from Prince George. And that is going to be live until April 16th. Every $5 you spend gets you one entry. Forgedinthebackcountry.com. And if you want to stay in the loop with my reviews and you want to participate in some raffles, mindful-reviews.com. Just wrapped up the Revic Rangefinding Bino raffle. And in the next two weeks, I'm going to be releasing the Prime RVX 34 review and raffle that I did over the last two months. And so if you want to come join a kick-ass community of gear focused, you know, positive hunters, mindful dash reviews.com. All right. Here's a conversation with Steve Isdall. All right. Good to meet you, man. (laughs) Good to meet you too. Thanks for taking the time, Steve. I've, uh, I threw the old hook out there a few times and I know you probably get slammed on there with messages. So I was kind of, I was pretty excited when I found out it kind of got through all the murk and, and you were able to reply. So thanks for that, man. Hey man. Thanks for being, but it's kind of funny, right? It's like, I, I, uh, I throw lots of shit out online, but I, I almost avoid the messages in a way. Cause I've got a yeah. lot of shit on the go. Right. And, uh, yep. It's literally if I get a, a message via how we hooked up, it's like it's like a uh, flip. It's just a, a pulling a card out of the deck. Yeah. So and a lot of people think, ah, hey, you snobby prick, you're not, you know. I'm like, hey man, like and and there's nothing worse than slinging. I don't, I hate the ego sh- part of anything. It's like I, and I, and I get kind of insecure. I don't want anything to be about me ever. I just like to promote hunting. Yeah. So it's just I just get a little weirded out sometimes. You know what I mean? And. Uh, What's it going to go with that? I just, I just, uh, I don't know. I'm not even awake yet. I got, I got one and a half coffees in me and I was up at four o'clock yesterday morning and you wouldn't believe what the hell we did yesterday and got home late. So I'm still kind of a little frazzled. I'll get my brain and my lips to line up smoothly in a second. <laughs> okay. Well, 
I'll give you a sec because I think a great way to kick this off, normally I would give like a little bio or I'd ask you to kind of introduce yourself. And I think a better way, you know, for us to kick this off is for me to tell a little bit of a story. So I grew up in Ontario and my thing with my dad's side of the family was an, a yearly moose hunt. So it'd be Northern Ontario, end of a logging road, couple of wall tents, 15 dudes hunting a cow tag. Like that was what hunting was. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. And it was like that you were lucky if you had the cow tag. Like it was, and it was like party hunting. So anybody could could use the tag. And to be honest, it was like more of a piss up chance to get away from all the wives. I was only 12 or 13 years old. I, you know, I'm shooting partridge with a 410, thinking it's the greatest thing in the world, getting out of school for a week. You know, it was uh Thanksgiving. It was always Thanksgiving weekend for a week or 10 days. But I did that for a couple of years and then I had a falling out with my old man's side of the family and I didn't really do much hunting again at all. Oh. And, and then I moved to BC when I was in my early 20s, tree planter for years, then ended up being a forestry engineer. So I was kind of spending my life in the mountains. And then I kind of got back into hunting through a buddy at work. I was living out in the valley and working all over BC, worked up on Haida Gwaii for two years, Fort St. John, like you name it. I lived on the island for a long time, lived in Holberg for, <laughs> for two years, doing layout all over the place. So finally go to get back into hunting. And this is kind of not pre-Instagram, it's about 10 years ago and there wasn't the resources that there are now, but hunting BC was still a pretty popular forum. You were pretty active on there. I'd gotten... Kind not obsessed with blacktail, but living in the valley. What else are you going to do? Uh, like, that's really all there is. And being a forestry engineer, I knew how to get around in that steep and deep shit that is like a barrier for 99%. Like, they look at it and they're like, you can't go in there. And I'm like, bro, I spend 10 hours a day in there. Like, that's that's the only place I go. Yeah, yeah. And so found all your stuff. I think you had just launched the app and maybe the app wasn't even available. It was just the videos on the YouTube channel. And I consumed everything, man, like <laughs> had it downloaded on the phone, rewatched it multiple times. I remember watching your, your still hunting example videos. And I still, to this day, don't think most people understand how excruciatingly slow still hunting is supposed to be. Because watching you in those videos, like you would literally set the camera up. There was like this little clearing. You would come in and you would act it all out. And it was like, I, I don't think you can explain that to somebody and actually have them get it until they see it. So anyway, so I watch all these videos. I do all these things. It took me two full seasons. My second season kind of out Chilliwack Valley. I probably put 30 days in, man. Like I'm talking scouting, setting up cams. I hadn't seen a single live deer. And it's <laughs> blacktail. You, you kind of don't like I was getting them on cam. I knew I was kind of in the right spot. I went out at one morning and I was just day hunting. I had a brand new kid, full-time job. So I would get like a day off once a week and I'd run out at three o'clock in the morning, hunt for the day and go home. And I go out this one day, hike all the way in. It's maybe nine o'clock in the morning. I'm using your calling techniques with uh, you know, I had a couple rattle hands and a little can call. And then I, I, and and I, my cameras had moved me through the mountains. Like I kept bouncing them around and I was fine. And then I'm like, oh, I'm in the spot now. Cause I was like getting regular bucks still all at night. This is like late October, probably getting close to Halloween. So like really starting to pick up and I'm walking along and I hit, and I forget what you call it, a rut hole. Like one of those, like the golden area where you start seeing the rubs all over the place. Sure. Yeah. And I'm just like, holy shit, it's Valhalla. Like, this is what he's talking about. And it was maybe just 100 yards from where my cams are. And I'd been to that place 20 times. But if you don't, it's they, they can be so concentrated that if you don't like walk through this like one little nugget, you could be 20 yards over there and not know this little hole was there. So I'm walking through this hole and I'm 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 doing my, my can calls and like out of the fucking mist, bro. Like he just comes like on a rope and yeah. I'm just like, holy shit. Like <laughs> 75 yards, uh, yeah. with my 30 yacht six savage, you know, smoked him. I was probably four or five kilometers from the truck in the middle of hell. And that was really my first 
solo buck. And like, if it wasn't for those, like, dude, if you want to go archery hunt elk in the States, there is terabytes of data online on how to do that. But when you talk about real coastal blacktail hunting, and I'm not talking the Oregon or the Cali ones, I mean like Northern BC, Northern Washington, coastal blacktails, like there's just no information out there. And that was kind of my exposure to you, but I've always wanted to get in touch because I, I owe you a lot of credit for that first buck, man. And that was what really lit the fire for me, especially for like solo backcountry. Like I'm just, it, it, and now it's just my life. I can't, I don't think about anything else. It's sweet, isn't it? Isn't it sweet when you get, when you finally score and you put it together? Oh. So, yes. Cause it's so rare, right? It's so yeah. freaking rare to see that damn deer, you know, like yeah. it still is today for me. I, I only see, like, like you said about the States, you know, and, and I don't knock anybody ever. It's what you have and what you grew up with and what you do and what you got. And when you see guys making black tail videos and they're sitting on an open slope of brown grass, glassing deer underneath an oak tree, it's like, oh, dude, seriously, if I was there, yeah. there wouldn't be any deer left. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, you get up in this jungle. It's it's so nasty, but I've got, I could babble like an idiot. I guess I've got to get lined out and take the stages, but... Um, I, cause I got a lot I could talk about when it comes to this hunting and lots of hunting and how, it, and, and people that I met and, and what they dropped on me and what changed my game. Right. Especially with these deer. But like you said, the steepness, even when I was living, I was working at Whistler for the last, I don't know, 16 years or 18 years living in Pemberton. And even all the local dudes, tons of hunters there, they all left, they all left yep. and went to Goldbridge to go be alert hunting. Yep. Nobody's into that shit. You know what I mean? If they were, they do the typical drive to the logging road sneak up the road, look in the slash, walk back to the truck, and it kind of sucked. That's 100%. what the majority of the guys do around here, right? Yep. And I maybe know. every now and then you luck one, you luck out and you'll you'll catch one in the slash. But like it's far more of a of a luck game than a than a skill game at that point. Yeah, you don't even know who you're shooting. Yeah. You know, like, I mean that's there's nothing like I say, there's nothing wrong. Everybody's got their own flavor, but for me, I just get it. I love finding out that there is a freaking monster buck living on that mountain somewhere and I'm going to get him. <laughs> but that's how I started. And I guess, like you said, you, you told your story. I guess I'll open up my quick little story. So here I am, grew up in Vancouver Island, Southern Island, not a hunting family at all, not a fisher family. My grandfather was a, a fisher and that was it, not a hunter. And then I just kind of came across it instantly because my parents split up, you know, same old shit story. Parents split yep. up. Mom left us with this abusive sack of shit. They moved to Souk, and they backed the home, backed onto wide open timber. Okay. So, and he worked at this big union sheet metal shop in Victoria, and all the guys in the shop were all hunters and anglers and a couple of bow hunters. And I used to have to go there and hang out and wait to get the ride up to Souk with this idiot. And then I got to know the guys in the shop, and the shop foreman was a hardcore bow hunter. And and I guess at one point he was trying to fit in the guys, it didn't work out. And uh, he had this, there was a recurved bow sitting there with dust on it, right? And I found the sucker. So instead of being in the house with this abusive, I won't get into that dark, but it's just a long time ago, right? It's yeah. just part of the story of how I got in the woods nonstop. And then I take this recurved bow and I had like three or four fiber, <laughs> this little fiberglass spined arrows with the pressed on tip. And I take that in the woods and I would get there on Friday after school. And all I had was runners on and the old red Mac jacket, you know? And I would dive into the woods until dark. My mom would have a nervous breakdown, of course. But And then I'd come in. I would make her set the alarm for 5 in the morning. And I would, this is like 11 years old, 10, 12. And I would get up at, yeah, 5 in the morning in my runners, run into the forest. And I wouldn't come back until maybe dinner time. And I was having too much fun. I'd come back at dark. That poor yeah. woman, right? And I did this nonstop. And I was chasing rabbits. I'm trying to kill a rabbit. And then I finally shot this rabbit. And it's almost like the kid that broke the the neighbor's window of the baseball, right? I shot yeah. something like, oh now what? Yeah. yeah. My God. So I got it out like a fish. I brought it home and got my stepmom to cook it for me. I ate that sucker. And then I guess Ding Dong went to work and told all the guys in the shop, oh, well, Diane's son went and shot a rabbit. And shop foreman says, well, he's, he can shoot a rabbit. He can go to one of our 3D shoots. So next thing you know, this saint of a human being, because he knew what, he, they all knew who this guy yeah. was, right? Yeah. He would come and get me. He would draw. Oh, you grew up in the, he, loved, he would come and get me from Langford, drive to Souk, pick me up in the dark and take me up and down Vancouver Island, going to all the 3D shoots that man. Yeah. 
And I met all these adults with big bows with wheels on them and camouflage clothing. And I'm like, holy shit, this is crazy, right? And I was splitting firewood at the time and tying fishing lures for spring king fishing lures and packaging them at home for make some money. I spent it on arrows. I spent it all on arrows, broadheads. And then I finally got my hunting license and get this one. And then I, I, I had my dad's second wife, her family was in Souk, coincidentally, and they hunted, but they was just jump in the truck, drive the logging road, wait for the sun to come up, look at the slash, jump in the truck, driver, and go, oh, these guys never got anything. But, and I couldn't hunt with a rifle by myself. And I finally got my, when I finally got my hunting license, I'm trying to make this short. And then, uh, but the whole time when I was out chasing rabbits, I was learning that spot, learning the deer that lived there. And here's this great big frickin' four point there. And I'd tell everybody about this buck. Of course, I'm not believing me, right? Yeah. The stupid kid that doesn't know shit. And he's got a bow and arrow because yeah. nobody's really bow, bow hunting wasn't big then. That's the and whole thing I'm thinking when you're talking. Like it must be, it's still not huge in BC. Back then, it must have been almost non existent. Yeah, people laughed. Yeah. And uh, especially these guys, my dad's second wife's family, they were like, Pfft, right? And then uh, I got my license, hunted with those guys, I shot a grouse. Shot a rabbit with my bow, and then I shot a grouse, and I shot a duck, and I still with my bow, and I still got the feathers and the foot from that rabbit tied together. Still got them. But anyway, and then there's the rut. Got my mom's drizzling rain, and I kept telling. I nicknamed him the cow. And nobody believed me. Nobody believed I'm seeing a four point. And these hunters, right? Yeah. And then uh, I went in there, snuck in there, and all of a sudden here he is finally, and he's out in the open with five does about eighty yards away from me, and my heart was ripping out of my freaking chest. I wanted that. I wanted that, probably like you, I wanted that so bad. So bad. Like I, it, I wanted, I had Chuck Adams, Bow Hunters Digest. I read it every single night. I read it 16 times. That's all they had. There's nothing. You know, Peterson's Hunting, remember that magazine? Yep. Maybe once in three seasons, there'd be an article on black tail deer. No way. You know, you get that and you just look at it because there's nothing on black tails, nothing, right? Yeah. Anyway, and then uh, they started moving away in the fog i'm like oh no oh no oh no no you know and the, i actually let her you're young and stupid i let an arrow rip and it actually went it cord he's cording away it went under his belly and they all took off over the rock and i almost i'm like oh my god no i gotta go to school on monday right this is saturday <sighs> and then um i couldn't sleep the next morning i went in there i just went to the same spot i waited the fog came up from from the ocean and i'm like oh no it's sunday he's gonna disappear it's the the right you know no 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 fog went away again i could see everything not a thing i i snuck up over the hill and there he was broadside about 12 yards from me i stuck him in the heart <sighs> right so he 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 takes off and i'm on rocky typical rocky bluffs moss yep, yep. timber he takes off pissing rain like you didn't believe i can't find him Oh my God, I can't find him. I'm sitting on a, I'm sitting in a puddle of a power line road, literally crying. Yeah. Cause I can't find him. Right. And then uh, I went back home, phoned my step mom's father. This little guy, one of those guys, that's just, you know, the quiet, scary guy that doesn't say anyway. You think he's mad all the time? No emotions, right? Oh, you're all, what have you done? I'll come up and give a, give a look. And he brought us 270 and we went right to where I shot from. Well, that buck just jumped off the rock and died. 15 meters away and landed on top of the bush to the side of the trail. So I was just walking right by him the whole time. Yeah. Yeah. That man, I'll never forget him. That emotionless guy with, you know, those, those glasses that change dark with the, those, yeah, yeah. just a, and he jumped up and down and grabbed, you got him. Like this, right? <laughs> I was like, oh. And then he, uh, he gutted it out. He put it in a backpack and he made me pack that sucker on my back. Oh, and then he wanted me, and then we're, we left there. We we're going to go to their farm and hang it up there. He wanted to drop me off on one side of Souk and make me backpack it through town because he was so freaked out, right? This yeah. stupid kid was bow and arrow. And then everybody started coming because they couldn't believe there was even a four-point buck. And that's how it started. So to fast forward what I was getting at, and like with what you just shared with you, your buck, I think that is probably why my whole life I have concentrated on finding that one buck and staying on him, right. you know? And once you get, because once you get the knowledge, it's just knowledge. Nobody's, we're all the same. It's just the knowledge and how bad you want it, how much you love it. That is the key ingredients, right? That's it. It's not, we're all, we're all exactly equal unless you're a lunatic enough like me to put that many <laughs> years into doing something like this. If I put the same amount into finding the cure to cancer that I did hunting, 
Yeah. I probably would have found the cure to cancer. That's a sign of insanity, right? So anyways, so that's what I did. And then, uh, I don't know, I could probably stop talking on that. I could keep, once I get going, I warned you, I'll keep talking. No, no, this is, this is what podcasts are for, man. This is great. I am, I'm really intrigued. Like everybody always talks about the, the, the glory days. And I think social media, you know, it's like a tool. It's a hammer. You can build a house with it. You can smoke somebody over the head with it. It's, it's equal parts, good and bad. But what was, do you really feel like, what was the hunting like back then? Like I, I even have a hard time imagining like, like what it was. I'm assuming word spreads via mouth that you you've killed this buck, but like, what are the, what are the opportunities? Like, when do you start leaving the Island? What are, are people actually like, are, are you doing big trips up North yet? Like, how does that all, when does that all kind of start kicking off? When you come from a non hunting family and you come from fricking Victoria, BC, right? Yeah. You're you're the you're the black sheep, but when you're going to little high school parties, people are looking at you like you're gonna kill it. You know, nobody hunted. I didn't have any hunting partners. But yeah. then once you just start finding your people, right? If you don't have anybody yeah. open that door for you, you just start finding your people, especially the 3D shoots. Right. But but on the same hand for me, I cut my teeth by myself. Like I shot my first nine deer I ever shot was a bow and arrow. I tagged out from that day on. I tagged out every single year of bow. Like, I don't know. It was just my thing, right? And then... Uh, I don't know if people understand how difficult that is, man. Like, uh, uh, a lower mainland or island blacktail alone and then with a bow and then to be able to do it year after year. Like, that is... It's an incredible accomplishment. Especially... Also, let's talk about the actual bow you were using. Like, my bow shoots, you know, 290 feet per second with 85% light off, let off at a 70-pound draw. Like, it's a... It might as well be a rocket ship compared to <laughs> whatever the hell you were using back then. Well, it's funny. When you talk about the gear, and I'm not I'm not, I'm, I'm not the big gear guy. Uh, were you on Hunting BC when I was on there? I mean, I think you were still... I was either reading your old stuff, but I think you were still, like, actively posting. I, it's going to be about 10 years ago now. Yeah, it was a while back, yeah. Yeah. Pretty popular threats. And the only reason I went on there was to try to spread uh, wolf wolf trapping and hunting knowledge. Right. I was trying to promote it because, you know, being in the outfitter background and then coming back, especially living permanent, I have permission to hunt, trap on three different trap lines. And I asked them, where do you guys get your wolves? Oh, we don't trap wolves. You never trapped a wolf here. But anyway, so that's another different, t- different topic. But that's how I got on hunting BC. I shot a big 154-inch blacktail. And uh, a buddy of mine was a moderator on hunting BC at the time. We're having beers at my place. And he goes, oh, you got to put on HBC. What the hell's that? And I still had a flip phone. He goes, everybody's on there. Mitch is on Everybody's on there. I'm like, I don't know. What are you talking about? And then you go, I'll put it on. He's all put it on there right now. Okay, go ahead. He put the picture of this hammer buck on there, and you go, see, this is all the people looking at. It. Blows <laughs> up. It. I'm like, oh yeah, crazy. And as soon as I saw the thousands of views in the picture, people freak out. My brain, my very first thought, oh my god, I can show all these guys how to catch wolves <laughs> and hunt wolves because I knew how important that is. But that's another topic, and that's how I got on Hunting BC, and that's when I first became aware of this internet shit right. and spreading knowledge. But uh, we're getting back to what about the equipment. So, uh, see, I can go off in different avenues. I'll get back to your question on the equipment. So, you know, here I am. I've been guiding for a long time and meeting everybody. And you watch them. It's almost like a dick slinging competition. I got the new this. I got the new that. I got the new that. I'm like, I don't really give a flying shit what you got. You put that, you put that broad head where it needs to go. That's all you need. You put that bullet where it needs to go. That's all you need. Nothing's going to change much. And they yeah, well, that's not powerful enough. And I go, tell you what, you go stand 200 yards that way. And I'm going to arc an arrow at you with the broadhead on it from this piece of shit bow. And you catch in your chest and you tell me how it wasn't powerful enough. <laughs> right? Just a, a rough shit eaten example of it. It doesn't matter what you buy. It doesn't matter. As long as you can keep that arrow going exactly where you want it to go. It could be a 40 pound piece of shit Walmart recurve. Yeah. You put that broadhead where you want it to go, you're going to kill everything. It's pretty simple. But like I said, with the internet and the gear and all the items, and that's just me, though. That's just me. I'm not shitting on products and gear. I'm just saying, if you want to get really just what it is, it, hunting is simple. It can be simple. It's like, how can I describe this? It's like horses. My old girlfriend had this, hunter jumpers. 
$80,000 horse that needed 16 different little tidbits all day long and put it in and out. And the best horses I ever had in the world was a $700 Heinz 57, never spent a day under the roof in his life. You know, it's simple. It can be simple or you can make it put so much more into it that doesn't really necessarily doesn't need to be much more into it. Here I am. I've got to get my lips meshed up with my brain again and get smoothened out here. Anyway, so the equipment. What are you shooting with back then? Sorry. Yeah, it just, it, it didn't really matter. My first compound bow, I'll never forget. I saved up my money. I saved up my money. I just wanted to have a bow with those wheels on it, like the guys at 3D shoot. And it was a PSE Laser Magnum. It cost $313.15 with tax included from Robinson Sporting Goods of Victoria. I'll never forget that day, right? <laughs> when I got that sucker and then it was game on. But And then I shot with that bow, getting to the equipment question, I shot that bow for until it, until it finally just blew up. Right. And then I got another bow, and I always shot bare bow because I've, I, am, I am left eye dominant but right-handed. Yeah. And the recurve I started with was right-handed bow, so I had to shoot that way. Okay. And I shot with finger tabs and strings. And then I shot that compound bare bow. We called it bare bow at the 3D shoots with finger tabs and no sights. And that's so not like, even a release? Mm-mm. Shot that way for years, and I mean years, until finally the first time I had sights was, I don't even know what year it was, I was guiding a TV show for PSE, a guy named Rocky Drake, good guy, got him a big record book moose, and the new bow at the time was X PSE X-Force, okay. the first X-Force, whatever, and it wasn't out to public yet, and I guess the, the big thing was TV shows, right, you used to light them, and the classic yeah. was to give them the weapon to the guy at the end of the hunt. And then I got that bow. I'll tell you what, it's like driving a Volkswagen bug all your life because cars do the same thing. Yeah. And then jumping a Lamborghini. <laughs> Holy shit. This thing is a freaking rifle, right? Yeah. And then, uh, and, had, and I had to use a release cause they're shorter bows, you know, right. the pinch and the strings too tight. And then I, and it had sight pins on it. So I just started still shooting right, left eye dominant and using sights was a little awkward, but I, started doing it and good god that thing was like you say like the bill you just described yeah. like it's almost like i'm an old fart now when you're talking about driving that 72 gmc pickup truck all your life because it does the same thing and now you're driving a great big you know 2024 f350 turbo that does everything but flip the pancakes but it's almost like the equipment today it's like a rifle i can pick that bow yeah. up right now well that bow i I wore that one out, and then I just bought another new one last year. I don't even know what it is—a bear or something. See, I'm not—I'm not up on this shit. It's just, oh, it fits. Okay, here we go. I'll learn how to shoot it, and it's, it shoots great. But uh, what was I getting at? The bow, the new bow, the sights, the gun. There's so much like a rifle. Like when I shot bear bow, it's like playing pool. You can be a wicked pool player, but you got to keep playing pool. You yeah. can't be a wicked pool player and leave it alone for even a month, because you know it's like shooting bear bow with archery. You have to keep shooting bare bow non-stop. And that's all I did, non-stop to stay on top of it. But I find with these, with the new equipment now, I can throw that bow in the garage, which I have done, and I'll pull it out and I'll shoot it like maybe three or four days and then I'll go hunting. Yeah. It's deadly accurate. It's dead. I can, I can put that arrow, that rear front sight. It's just like a rifle to me. You know, a lot of guys shoot all the time, but see, there's a bit of a big long ramble on the question about what you shot back then, right? <laughs> Oh, I love it. So <clears throat> when do you start adventuring off the island? So obviously, you know, blacktail is a passion, you're hunting them, but I know you have a big history of, of guiding up north. You've taken some in, incredible animals. When does like venturing out from, from home and doing these kind of, you know, bigger hunts further away come on your radar? Well, then we know you get start. You get a little old. You start. You enter the workforce. You know, you're meeting people out of place instead of just your neighborhood at school. And then you start finding your people, man. You start finding guys that are in hunting, and then you make friends with people. Next thing you know, hey, you want to come mule deer hunting? Okay. Right. But I'll tell you what. It's just like when I hunted with the. Uh, I guided with one of the largest names in commercial. I call it commercial hunting, right? The TV show circuit, and uh, he had world records and everything with muzzle loaders, right? And all this, this whole list of of. Uh, of accomplishments and I'm like, how come you never write about or talk about blacktail? Quote, I gave up on those years ago. Right. Right. And I go, hmm. and he said too, and he lives on the island, said, you know, as far as I'm concerned, you take any Vancouver Island blacktail hunter and kick him loose up north, everything's gonna die. Right. 
It's true. You grow up shooting and hunting game in the in this jungle here, and you get consistent. You go up north, everything's dead, <laughs> right? And it's not because you're any. You, everybody's equal. It's just where you grow up and how you learn and what you learn to deal with, and then you apply those skills once you've mastered it and take it to any other species. I don't give a shit what anybody says. I've hunted and guided basically everything, and there is nothing harder than. Let me put it this way. You know, you got these guys, you know, wild sheep have been blowing off the chart for popularity due to yeah. the internet, as far as I'm concerned, the clubs. But you get guys got the plane, and we talk about this shit. What is it right now? It's like 75, 80,000 US yep. or something. Let me put it this way you get off the plane, I guarantee you, I'm going to show you an eight year old ram in, in less than 10 days. Right. I'm just going to for your 75,000 US. But if you take me to somebody, who guarantees me they're going to show me an eight-year-old black tail in less than 10 days. Right. I'll eat a dog shit sandwich on video every single day. That's not yeah. going to happen. Do yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Totally. It's crazy. But anyway, so yeah, getting back to the question, go to the mainland, went mule deer hunting. And obviously it was, it was so easy. It was stupid, but I was so freaked out at seeing this deer over 200 pounds at my feet. Oh, yeah. What? What? You know what I mean? I was pretty excited. Yeah. So I got into that for a bit and then, uh, Ended up shooting. Actually, there's this guy right here. I don't know if you can see it. If you want to see it, but this is one of the I'd biggest ones. Got right there. 194 inch buck. Look at the and, mass and, uh, on that. Yeah, he was mounted. Then he got a little messed. I'm gonna get it remounted again. But anyway, I'm not a big fan of. The, anyway, um, started doing that, and then I met another buddy who wanted me to go sheep. Asked me if I wanted to go sheep hunting. I fixed his camera. Okay. Yeah, you look good. And I literally had, I had cotton. Had the old cotton. Military surplus camouflage. Yeah. <laughs> right? Had these dog shit hunting boots. And you know what I brought for ring here? I brought a clear plastic poncho. <laughs> right? And that's what we wore. And this is a funny moment. So we went up, we, I don't know how old we are, early 20s or 21 or so. I don't know. 21, 20. And I went up there. And then uh, I didn't even, I, I, I spotted. And I'm not slinging my dick. I'm just saying how my life went. Um, I probably spotted every single ram, and it was so. It just seemed so easy yeah. to me. We got it. Are you got, hiking in? How are you even getting in? Are you horses? Back, back in, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I, no, I bought a Camp Trails frame pack. Okay. We hiked in, backpacked in, and then. Uh, what do you got for glass back then? They got to be just. I didn't have any binoculars. My buddy did. Okay. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I know this is going to, for today's hunter, this is going to sound yeah. like, would you grow up a caveman or something? Right? Yeah. <laughs> so what honestly happened, man. And then, uh, but I have a rifle scope. I was spotting, I was just spotting, it was easy. And then uh, we found this absolute, I found this absolute crank. When I look back now, the size of this ram would, today would make anybody vomit. Right. And there he was, he was uh, snapped off, probably, now I look back, he was probably a 12, 13 year old ram, at least 170 inch ram tipped on one side snapped off in the other with four other rams walked across the valley went up went after the next morning we had him about 200 yards away but he was across these cliffs we didn't think we'd get to him so we didn't shoot him but now that i know now <laughs> you idiot right and then we ended up getting a big 38 inch ram my buddy shot it but that was it but here's the key point of that whole trip for me we're driving down alaska highway and i remember thinking we're just going through toad river and i was thinking to myself i didn't want to go home i could do yeah. this every day all day easy this is stupid why am I going home? And get this one. This is funny. We're driving down the highway. We're across the, t the North Tessa Bridge. Yep. Here's these greasy cowboys on the side of the highway. No trucks around. A bunch of horses, pack horses, and all the shit stacked yep. up. And I remember seeing those guys. And I drove by, and I'm like this. Yeah. I'm like, those are the coolest MFers in the whole planet. Right? Yeah. Now get 100%. this. 100%. Get this one. Years later, that is my drop-off point to the trailhead to go into my camp. <laughs> How crazy is that? Yeah. I think I think it's only a couple years later. I guess I'm getting carried away here. But anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up going. I went up. I sent off to save a bunch of other stupid life stories. When it came down to a point where I just like I'm just done. I had a whole string of bad luck for a while. I'm just done. I'm done. Why am I even alive? And I was in Alberta. I went to a mall and I grabbed a Big Game Hunting Adventures magazine off the shelf. And I'm not kidding. I was thinking about booking out of here. Yep. At yep. that moment. And I went in the back of the big game hunter magazine and I found all these outfitters and I hand wrote 
uh, 12. I've, I went over and I recognized a bunch of guys that had seen, you know, the old VHS tapes and shit. Yep. And I thought, you know, you're just still going like this to those guys. Oh my God, these guys are gods, you know? And then I sent off 12 <laughs> handwritten letters, got 14 replies. Three months later, I'm North Alaska Highway with 25 horses heading into frickin' heaven. Isn't that crazy? And then, yeah. uh, and here's one part. And I, I, like I said, you know, after you got, I've got a lot of people, I met a lot of people. And as you know, like I just had some antlers measured the other day. And it's the first time I've ever done it because I don't like, I just don't like competition between humans when it comes to hunting. It's just me. I just, I've seen so much ugly in that department. You know what I mean? Like Have you ever a, entered any of your black tails? That was something else I thought I've heard that you've never actually entered any of your black tails in the book. No, that's so crazy. But I mean, good on you. Cause who really gives a shit, but anybody but else on the planet who had your black tail resume, it would eat up half that book. Yeah. But you know what though? It's like, I'm slowly warming up to it and I shouldn't be. Cause I, well, I did talk to the guys, the scores at this thing in Count Verbe the other day. Yeah. That big buck contest thing you went to. Yeah, and I yeah. just sent him flat out, and I waited. It was over at three o'clock, and I waited till two thirty because I didn't want to see a pile of people there. I didn't want to see, I'd see competition like that. I just don't like it. I'd rather yeah. just enjoy the hunting. Like I, I, I remember when I first came up with the app idea because after watching, guiding all the TV shows, if you saw the bullshit that goes on behind the camera, it just oh. makes you want to vomit. Even the largest names, and I won't say in those names. <laughs> if you knew the truth, yeah. it makes you sick. So, and I was just like, after that final stint in the Yukon, I'm like, good God, how the hell can I get true knowledge to people without it being about me? I don't right. want it to be about me. I don't want to be like these guys. It, I just love hunting so much. It saved my life. I grew up with it. I, I, that's all I've done. I put all so much of my life into it. It's just the way I live. And it has nothing to do with Tom, Dick, and Harry. If I can give you guys all the knowledge I got, I will, man. I, I just want, I need, I need you guys to get better because it's more converse, conservation dollars and it keeps everything going. Another yeah. story, but I'm just, if you'd believe how many guys get off the bush plane up North and look, I just want to be in the book, man. I just, I just want to be in the book. And that's any, for me, it kind of makes you go, Oh God. All right, here we go. Let's get your shit and get you out of here because you don't give a shit what, how beautiful everything is. Right. You don't appreciate this experience, this whole episode in your life that you're going to remember every single tidbit of it in that lazy boy. They don't think that way. A lot of guys don't. And that's how I got jaded. And that's why I refuse to put anything in the book because it's not about the book. You know, that's probably why. But I'm starting to lighten up to it because, like, I talked to that scorer and he said, well, we, it's actually, he said, it's a real good way for us to see the change in the game yeah. over the years and document it. And then Sarah's going, you, haven't, you didn't have any kids. You got to leave something. Put them all in the book. Because, you know what? There's probably there's a, there's multiple book size animals right outside this door of every species. Yeah, I bet. I don't need to. I don't need it. I don't need anybody to see it, or I don't need that stroke. I don't care. It was my memory. All the are is memories. That's just a memory. Like here's another funny one. But to try to explain my attitude, not put in the book. I'll get the guy at the bush plane if I don't know him. I go. So uh, did you bring Stanley? We all me. Stanley. Did you bring Stanley? Who's Stanley? The tape measure. Oh, well, you don't like Stanley? I go, there's only one thing that's going to ruin this hunt, and that's Stanley. There's no room for Stanley here. You're going to have a great time. You can go play with Stanley when you get home. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, and it's also another famous one. I said to him, I go, hey, just so you know, if I get you the world record grizzly bear or, or stone sheep tomorrow, if you got off the plane and your peepee's that big, you're going to go home with your peepee that big. <laughs> Just so you know, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So I'm just, I, I tried to emphasize more on everyone if I could to focus on the freaking the real good, sweet part of it. You know, that adrenaline, that excitement, the healthy part of it, that experience yeah. and what you just pulled off with your buck and Chilliwack, putting all the time in one-on-one. -on -one. You don't have a camera following you. You didn't have to brag about it. And you know what I mean? You're not in competition with another guy. It's just yeah. it's so... I try to disconnect myself with it. So that's why I never put anything in the record book because of the attitudes that I came across got in the game so much. And also too, you're on hunting BC and I post up these pictures and then you get the guys who are very competitive and they just start, they just full of hate. Right. Yeah. And then they start saying shit. It's like, you know what? Get out of here. <laughs> but anyway, that's another bit of a ramble, but there you go. I hope I got it across clearly how I possibly got a little eh, record book. Eh. But I'm starting to see the good of it. So yeah. I, 
I do think there is, uh, and and they, apparently that's why they started Boone and Crockett was to have this like longitudinal kind of assay of the health of, and I never understood net and gross. It didn't make any sense to me, but their argument is, I guess they're, they, they look at those things as almost deformities and they're trying to look at the overall health of the species over a long period of time. I guess I can see the the argument to it. And, and I mean, it's interesting data for sure. And I do think, you know, there's the element of, of accomplishment, like for a lot of dudes, like a 180 mule deer is like that thing being, you, you know, it is an accomplishment to be able to, like, I've kind <clears> of, <throat> I still have a long way to go as a hunter. I, you know, I'm, I'm getting better. I've, I, I have my fair share of success these days, but I stay in my own lane and I don't, you know, make myself out to be something I'm not. But I'm getting to that point now where I'm selective. I used to just be, if I could find something and it was legal, like that was a win. It's dying. And I'm going home with the biggest shit eating grin on my face. Yeah. But now I'm getting to the point where, and it's not, it doesn't come from ego. Well, maybe it's partly ego, but it's like, I don't want to kill a, a a child. That's what it feels like. And it, and it's more about like you on your quest to find those big bucks isn't about the ego. It's about finding that worthy adversary. Like you want to be kind of in that competition or in that battle with that animal that's at that same level as you. And I think as we elevate as hunters, our targets should elevate as well because I want to be targeting. And that's why I think age might even be a better um, determinant of a trophy than antler size sometimes. Like being able to kill a mule deer over four and a half years old might actually be more impressive than killing a mule deer over 180 inches because he could have been a dumb three and a half year old that just had fantastic genetics. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's like uh, the big buck thing. Um, like, well, you know, a lot of people hunt for different reasons, right? Sure. So I kind of, I've come across tons of people that shot whatever they shot and they just toss the antlers out in the back 40. Like right. I was at my partner's, my guy partner's up north one time. He's, oh, my girlfriend's parents were looking for a set of moose antlers. She's got a 210 inch freaking moose rack sitting there. All right, well, take these. Like, she just does not give a flying shit. Yeah. It, when he shot that bull that day, he could have shot a fork. It would have been the exact same outcome for that, for that flavor of hunter, right? <laughs> so yep. anyway, everybody's into their own, but... It's an, and that's another big argument is, well, you can't eat antlers. I'm a meat. And, okay, you've seen it online a million times. Well, I just shot this meat deer. Yeah. Everybody always starts off saying that goofy statement, oh, I shot it as a meat buck. Huh? What are you actually talking about? Right. right? If you were solely about meat, you would have shot and held out and shot a big mature buck, which coincidentally will probably have some big antlers at the same time. Yeah. But that's your meat deer. This is your barely any meat deer. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you want to talk common sense, that's a barely any meat deer. Just so you know, you know, you can maybe make soup out of it for the next four days for your family of five. That's about it. So maybe you should might want to think about holding out for a larger bodied full meat deer. And it will also help. It will, it will make you apply like conservation to your spot. You know what I mean? Like just take those, just take those big mature bucks and that's it and let them grow and let them populate and don't educate the shit out of everything by shooting all these little baby baby deer. Because next thing you know, you won't see anything there. Trust me. And it's not because everything got shot. It's because you educated the smart ones. Right. That's what's going on. And that's an, another point I'd like to make eventually as we talk. You can't let me forget about what the biologist taught me when okay. it comes to that department. But that's... What are we even talking about? We we're trying to get the point. See, I can go, I can talk like crazy and go down 15 different routes, right? But I think yeah. you're asking me about the, not if it's ego or not when you want to get the big buck. Yes. No, it's not. It's exciting. I don't give a shit what anybody said. It is freaking exciting. When you're a hunter, you love hunting. You just want to get that tag cut, but holy crap. And then you see that one in a million buck that nobody sees. It's that 12 volts of freaking electricity through your yeah. spine. That nothing else could have created that electrical shock and it gets addictive, right? It's exciting. Yep. Oh my God, that's exciting. And then the the harder the goal, the more charge you get through your spine, right? It's like yep. crazy. Oh my God, that was so wicked. You know, you don't, you know, it's like, and you're not going to throw your equipment away after you do it once. Like, I want to do that all the time. I want to do that every week. But that and actually, then I think it gets to the point where the, the younger guys don't do it. Like, they don't scratch that itch, they don't provide that same 12 volt 
shock. And it just doesn't feel the same. And you know it when you feel it. And I think that's the thing. Like, that's how I knew I was kind of like evolving a little bit or or gaining in skill as a hunter because I did take that one kind of younger buck and I walked up on it and I'm like, I shouldn't have done that. Like, I'm better than this. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I got it. It's legal. There's nothing wrong with it. But I still had three days left in my hunt. Yeah, like there was more ground to cover. There was more area to glass. Like, and it didn't feel the same way as it does when you get that animal and it's hard to explain, but that one that just fits the bill, it's like, yeah, this is what I came here looking for. It's a tough thing to talk about too. It's a tough thing to share with people because there it's a tough thing because it's so yeah. easily slides into the ego thing and the competition, yeah. but it's not, this has no. nothing to do with anybody, you know, and especially when you, when you share it publicly, well, you're going to get hammered on, you know, you're just a trophy hunter. That's where the antis have us. It's like, I really want to steal that word back because I'm sorry, it is a trophy, but it's a trophy I'm proud of. It is, it is a commemoration and a celebration of something that was incredibly challenging, took years of my life to build up the skill to be able to do this, might have taken weeks of, of scouting and days of being cold and wet. And it's like, I, it just blows my mind that that has become like uh, a curse word in the hunting industry. And it's like, like, oh, you're not one of those trophy hunters, are you? And I get in those conversations now and I'm like, yeah, I am. Because I don't go out and kill the first legal thing I see. I try and spend the time and energy to find the oldest, most mature representation of the species that I can find. And if you want to call that a trophy, then I'm a trophy hunter. Well, you know, it's a tough, you know, you know, the, you know, the whole volume that goes back and forth when you get 100%. into that. You just have to uh, walk away. You can't. Yeah. You can't talk to those people. You can't. No. You know, like I don't know if you're around. When I started the big, the big wolf, the wolf movement, and I had all these people coming at me, and I didn't give a shit. I got Dave Suzuki trying to come at me. CBC News, Global News, CNN even wanted to come and do a interview. You know what we were going to do? Because they're such so dark. We were actually going to take them up up into the mountains and kick them off the sleds. And say, see you later. Get a ride home. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> but anyways, it's like. All I said flat out is so easy when people attack you with anything, any topic, especially the wolf thing, we use an example. They're like, I can't believe you're doing this, can't believe you're doing that, blah, blah, blah. And I go, yeah, you care about the animals, do you? Well, I just spent about uh, 90 days out there in the snow, and I never saw your boot print once. Yep. Wait a minute. I didn't see anybody's boot prints once while I was out there seeing what the sheep and the moose and the elk and the mule deer, mule deer were doing there. And I was watching the wolves blow up. And I didn't see you there. So why do you get to even take part in this conversation? Because I just threw down $10,000 of my own money last year to take care of this wolf problem without asking anybody or even letting anybody know I was doing. Where were you? And you think, it, okay, here I am getting fired up, right? You get my point. So Yeah, 100%, man. You can't talk, you can't engage those people. Like the word trophy hunter, and we're guilt, mm. hunters are guilty of promoting it themselves. How many hunters do you hear saying, well, I'm not a trophy hunter, but... yeah. Shut up. Why would yeah. you even open with saying that? Just quit saying that shit. Yeah. Right? No, so I'm with you. Yeah. Joke okay, so let's 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 backtrack a little bit. You send the 12 letters, you get the 14 replies, you go up north. What is guiding in a sheep camp look like back then? Eh, well, that first outfit um they do, they only had one tag every 3 years for sheep. Wow. So, yeah, but it was a smaller outfit, and they were really challenged. And uh, but I was I had to hike up to the height of land and look on that side of the hill. Okay, and that was the infamous Stone Mountain Safaris area. Okay, the International Outfit of the Year award, like multiple years straight, hadn't had a new crew member in eight years, and they had. I show you photographs one day. Oh my God, it's just these these guys were the shit of the shit. You know, right. the best crew noted in the outfitter industry then for years. And uh, that, that they just, you're just looking over there drooling. Oh, yeah. oh my God. Oh my God. And how can I say this? Because it's tough, it's tough to talk about your past and your accomplishments because you're just so over worried about coming across and slinging your dick. You yeah. know what I mean? It's tough. But when I went there, I, they had 12 guides in various camps, and I harvested 75% of the take out of 12 guides for the whole season. And I just say, I only, it, I found what I was supposed to be doing in life. That's, that's why. And I grew up hunting black-tailed deer in a jungle. 
<laughs> that's that's why. So anyway, I sent off letters to Stone Mountain Safaris. And at the time, it would have been like when the Oilers were winning the Stanley Cup nonstop, right? right? And I'm playing and I'm playing hockey in the freaking parking lot behind the supermarket. And I send off a letter to the Oilers. Can I come and play hockey with you guys? Right? Handwritten letter. I'm like, ah, this will never happen. And then uh, all of a sudden I got a phone call. I'm like, hello? Is this Steve? Yeah. This is uh, Dave Wayne, Stone Mountain Safaris. And I'm like this. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> 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 and, and then uh he goes well comes up we uh we got an opening here first time in eight years and then uh they invited me up i was ter- i was terrified i was freaking terrified because i held this place and all these guys like they're way up there right yeah like, yeah oh my god oh my god oh my god that's just anxiety holy shit oh my god and you go there and all the history there and all the photos on the wall and all those rams holy crap right and uh so what's it like i don't know it's different i don't know if it's different now but i just remember those days they were just so they're the best days of my freaking i was the only guy at the end of the season i was just depressed when I got tagged out you know my right. partner everybody you guy did you get it yet no oh because everybody just wants to go home right it's been in the woods for three months yeah. i don't want to go home <laughs> no I, even dave said he said to me he goes out of all my years and everybody i've never seen anybody that loved it as much as you yeah. period right like i was a freaking i just loved it sorry i got my dog right here bugging me but anyways what's no, it like great. what's the question what's it like being a sheep camp back then yeah i don't know well you you've been sheep hunting right yeah you know the feeling you get in those mountains it's the best right there's nothing else i've been i've been lucky i get to do i get to do a whole bunch of shit um but there is especially when you're going in deep like that's my thing. I love going in solo. I love 12 or 13 days. And when you get in there and it's that quiet and you're so far away, you just, you feel a level of psychological disconnection from everything that I, I have a hard time coming back. And my wife, it's taken a lot of years for me and my wife to figure out the system. Cause I used to just be a bear. Cause like <laughs> I couldn't handle the noises. I couldn't handle the people. And I would be depressed because like you, you know, I've got a pretty dark past, you know what I mean? I'm clean now, a whole bunch of stuff. But it was like, when I went out there, I was like, oh, this is where I'm supposed to be. Like, Bingo. I, I was born to be here. I feel more myself. I, I'm not, when I'm out here, man, I'm like, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I'm always playing this, like, what does a normal person do in this situation game in my fucking head? Yeah, yeah. But when I'm out there, I never ask those questions. If I'm successful, if I'm not successful, if it's good, if it's bad, it doesn't matter. I just, I feel at home and no place more so, you know, go kind of fall into that category too. But that severe, like go in, go deep, go long, like nothing else feels like that. And when I, it, it's hard to, I've gotten better at it now, but it took a long time to be able to make those. And I can't even imagine going in for, like I used to go tree planting for months at a time in the summer and it would be kind of similar coming out for that back to society. But I can't even imagine like going into the sheep mountains for three straight months and then trying to come back down to the lower mainland. I would be like, it's such a culture shock, man. Like it's so overwhelming. Well, there's the thing about what you're trying to explain that this might be another way route to do it. It's we, it's when you're living a hundred percent, you're living at a hundred percent. Yes. You are, there's zero bullshit. Yeah. Like there's nothing. There Nothing. is absolutely no bullshit. Everything around you has been here for yep. freaking ever. It's never changed a bit. You don't mean anything. You're Zero. This, this this tiny, insignificant little hair on a pimple on the ass of the planet, and that's all. Yep. You know. And, but there's you're you're living 100. percent You love it, so you find your true passion. You're immersed in your true freaking passion. It's you're in a soup of it. You don't want it to end, right? Nothing matters. You don't have to be or do or nothing. It doesn't matter. And you're loving the living shit out of every breath while you're there. And then you get out. And then you got to kind of reintegrate into the bullshit, right? Yeah. Sucks. But, you know, talking about three months, guess what I do after that? I go three months up there. Well, July, I go up July, help catch a few horses early. And then you ride in. If you got extra time, we can salt licks and just ride around being immersed in it and then uh july august september october i come home 
last week, October. And then I'd dive straight into blacktail hunting and I wouldn't stop. And I would blacktail hunt every single effing day until the end of the season. So I was rally, I was doing, I don't know, 250 days a year in the woods, I guess, maybe. I don't know. Yeah. yeah it really makes the sad part is, like you said, like you go on your sheep hunt, you come home, the bullshit is in your face everywhere you look. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's so hard to come home and, and not be there. But I guess we're getting back to the question, but what's it like being in a sheep camp, right? Yeah. Yeah. But that's what I think we, we, I think we've, I hope we clearly delivered what it's like to people listening, what it's like to be in those freaking mountains. It's like, oh, you just want to go get that ram's going to make your dick bigger. Yeah. We don't, we shouldn't even be talking to each other. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You're yeah. so not getting anything. Like, it's so hard to not engage, right? But once you engage, I call it, it's like hitting a speed bump. They're just going to keep you back here for a bit. I don't have that time to waste now. Move on. Get out of my way. It's it's just, I think we described it smooth. I, 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 yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I think too, like I know some people are going to want me to pick your brain about tips and tactics. And I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of that. But I also think the volume of material you have online, like that's what is so great about the catalog you created is that stuff is always going to be there. But I think mm. if anybody takes anything away from this conversation, it's, and I've been very fortunate. I, I started filming my hunts. I like creating memories. I've got a daughter. I like being able to share them with her. I never really expected it to kind of turn into what it's turned into. But with my background in the mountains, I was kind of making more like mountain hunting films than like hunting films. Like I wasn't even that successful at the beginning, but people liked watching my films because I would go to these crazy places and film these crazy mountains. And very early on, I recognized that, oh, I can deliver value by sharing the adventure. And then if something doesn't die, you're still a cool film at the end and you still have this cool message. But I think if anybody can, especially the younger and the more newcomers, can take anything away from, from this conversation, it's like focus less on the outcome of the kill at the end and more about being present for the, for the experience in the middle and if you do that long enough and you work hard enough, I feel like that those outcomes at the end take care of themselves. But if all you're doing is thinking about that outcome at the end, you miss, and you, you probably still will be successful at the amateur, but you're going to do it at the expense of missing all that other stuff, which is arguably more important. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of people that, that, that miss it. And it's not just yeah. hunting in life in general, right? There's a lot of people miss the, they're missing it. And I'd hate to be on my deathbed and if, and also becoming aware of it 10 minutes before you pass, that would really yeah. suck. But like I got good buddies who are sheep guides and the amount of guys who hit the in reach to change their flights, the instant their client kills, they're like, you wouldn't believe it, man. We've been in here for six days. They still got five days left. We could go chase something else. We could go like trip around. We could do a million things. As soon as that sheep is dead, they're switching the flight and they're, they're looking to get back to camp. And that's the part I don't get. Like, how do you, you want to go back to Tennessee or wherever the flip you're from? Like, I don't like, dude, you are in the middle of the Rockies. Like it's arguably the coolest place on the planet. Yeah. Well, that's a tough one. That's another, it's almost like a whole nother topic in a way, because it's not, we're not, we're not talking about hunting in general or hunters in general, or living at a hundred percent and being passionate because that, that topic, sadly, a lot of times isn't even a part of those guys in that hunt. It, right. And it never will be. And yeah. what I would do to weed through those guys, see, I, I've got some places where you ride your horse and uh, I've done it a million times and I still, you cannot not stop, tie up and take pictures. It just right. is absolutely freaking mind boggling, right? So what I would do if I had a guy, new guy, is I'd ride him up there without telling him where we're going or why we're going there to wait right. for their honest reaction. And then I would know how to gear up the rest of the hunt. So, it, but sadly, probably, I don't know, seven out of 10 of these guys, I'd ride up there and they're behind me, all the yards behind you. So I'm waiting to hear something. No reaction. I look back and they just be sitting there going like this. And then I'd know, all right, I just got to hurry up, get him what he wants and get his ass out of here and not go that extra distance to show him every experience I can. But then... Then you get the right guy and you go right up there and you haven't, you just cutting out into the open. Oh my God. Oh my God. Can we please stop here? And then I go, yes, now it's going to be a good hunt. Yeah. Yeah. Game on. Right. And then we're going to milk every single freaking day out of this hunt that we can and squeeze every drop out of it. 
before you got to go home. But getting back to those guys, yeah, you can believe some of the shit you see, right? But yeah. it's, and I don't want to create a negative, a negative, uh, anything negative on the hunt or guiding or guided hunts. I don't want to do that. So, because you can take this personality trait and you can apply it to a lot of things in life, not just hunters. Right. You know, like that's yep. what you have to try yep. to stress before we go into this topic. It's, it's just a human characteristic that is everywhere and it's not just hunting. And if it isn't hunting, big deal. It doesn't mean hunting's bad. It doesn't mean going on a guided hunt's bad. It doesn't, there's no badness here. We're just pointing out the odd character flaw, I call it, in some individuals <laughs> yeah. who ha we so happen to be talking about with hunting. But yeah, so I'll get guys. It's, you know, the clubs, you know, as you know, when you get into the sheep, the sheep clubs, yeah. That's one of the biggest dick slinging groups there ever, there'll ever ever is when it comes to hunting, and it's it's a lot of money. It's a lot of uh, right. It's huge yep. dollars. Then with huge dollars, a lot of people who have huge dollars have got that ego of being number one, or or they want to be talked about. Though they want to be the focus. Right. So the clubs really created a lot of these guys. Not the hunting did the club. The clubhouse. I had a lot of guys come up. They didn't even know anything about sheep. Right. <laughs> Nothing. All they knew is. They were going to go to Fanaz or whatever, and they needed a ram, or else they got the three-quarter slam, and I got to get my slam. But they don't have a clue about what we've just been talking about, the passion and living at 100%, milking every drop out of the hunt. They need to get that ram and get that done. Right. End of story. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and it's, it's sad in a way, but people say to you, too, with guiding, well, man, it must be, must be really hard. Eh? It must be really hard having guys like that. I'm like, hell no. Are you kidding me? These guys are packing my gun, pulling the trigger for me, and they got to go home. And I get right. to stay and do it again. This is heaven. Keep them coming. <laughs> right. You know, and I got patience. You got patience to deal with different characters, right? So you can accommodate somebody's personality. Sure. And and still make it a good time when, meanwhile, you know, sometimes you're sitting there, oh, my God, please, because I just fall off of this horse and die right now. <laughs> you know, as an extreme example, I've had some, some characters come up there that any human being would probably want to put them in a box forever, but. Yeah, see, I'm starting to battle like an idiot again. I'm all fired up and revved up with all these memories and feelings. But here's another example. I had a guy one time, big money guy, big money guy, one of the first people that ever hunted China and our golly rams and stuff. And got his wife a 165 inch ram the year before or something. And he comes up and he saw my partner and they hunted 11 days, last hunt of the year, too. It was snotty, shitty out. They couldn't find a legal ram. And then uh, it was such a brutal. Brutal hunt. Funny memory. I got it on video too. Because I, another thing aside on the video, I've always loved video recording. Even back when you go to the VHS, the, the video store, and then these great big VHS cameras where you stab that tape in there. I used to put aside money so on payday I could go rent the camera and try to get a steelhead with it or something. I always loved it. So I always, while guiding, I had a video camera. I made myself hang a video camera here with my binoculars every single day. I've got probably 15 external drives of content. I don't know why back then I just did. It filled everything. Yeah. Anyway, so I have this hunt on film. I should I should lace it up and post it because it's pretty comical. So uh, I'm getting back to the sheep hunter thing and the, what they're, what some people miss and talking about what you said to the inreach, which we only had satellite phones then, but even then before that, we didn't have anything. Anyway, um, so this guy's gone through a flat-out knockdown, drag you through the dirt and grime hell hunt hasn't found a legal ram, and then we're going to ride up to the highway. It's the end of the season, right? And we're jacked up. You know, it's a big piss up at the ranch at the end. And, and then you can't go into the ranch, and you can't have a beer until you pull all the shoes off your horses. Okay. So we're like, let's pull our shoes off right now. <laughs> we're in camp, right? Because it's mostly trails, and we've got to cross a couple of creeks and rocks. It's not bad. So we pulled all the shoes off. Packed up camp. We rode out to the highway, and, this, and the weather was real shitty, so he had to ride with us. Get up the highway, get picked up, and get back in. And Dave goes, oh, we're going to send you guys up such and such creek because we really got to get this ram. This is the auction ram. And we're like, what? <laughs> no, we're not. Really? And you got to go too, Steve, because this is another area where I would spend my August and my partner being the hunt we're just at now. And then after I'm done my August sheep hunts, then I would go into that camp and spend the rest doing moose, grizzly, and sheep and whatever, right? I'm like, oh, no. So here we go, right? I said to my partner, I go, well, you go get the, you can get the camp set up because we have different sections of camp stowed away, like stuff for remote camp without a cabin, right? right? So you have all the cutlery and an apron, roll it up. 
your, your temps, your flippers. And they got basically a grocery store there. So I'd go in and I got the food because there's still uh, four days left in the season, I think. Okay. Maybe three. I don't know. So now, and it's all riverbed riding horses up river rock. And we, we threw all the shoes off Took the shoes off my, I'm not kidding you. My <laughs> heels, and this isn't abuse. <laughs> my heels were hurting from kicking my horse to get up that river <laughs> and, and it was snowing and it was, it was drizzle snow and it was about minus 15. Get this one. We get up there and there's a rabbit. <laughs> I'll never forget. I got on video. There's a baby rabbit this big and he's sitting where the fire pit is. He's sitting in the fire pit like this. <laughs> I walked right up to him like, what are you doing? <laughs> and he wouldn't move and I picked him up like, even the rabbits are bad enough up here. And I, and I took the pack saddle pad off of the warm horse and I put the rabbit in the pack saddle. Uh-huh. Off, right? And I put him off to the side and we start unpacking our shit. We're, up, we're just at tree line, right? There's like two or three spruce right here, two or three there. And these spruce are stripped clean from us camping there for since freaking camp had they had a camp in there since 1969 or something. So anyway, oh, did my partner forget to get the hose that connects the little, we have those little propane bottles. They look oh. like a pounder, but those little pony ones, you know? Yep. Yep. Forgot the hose that connects that to the stove. Right. Then opens up the apron. He's going to grab the apron, but somebody, oh, through the whole season, people are pinching shit and grabbing shit here and there and not refilling it. We've got a wooden spoon. <laughs> I think we had two mugs, <laughs> three plates, one fork. It was like so cringe, right? Yeah. You know, those old blue, you know, the blue metallic camp wear, you know? Yep. You yep. The creek, it's the little it dots up. on it. Yeah. Yeah. You scoop up the water in the creek, come back yep. to the fire, 10 feet, and there's ice on top of it. <laughs> right? Hell. Brutal. Hell. And we have one pack box full of grains. We're not going to cut them loose. So anyway, and you just, you're just hating life. So, uh, I don't know what happened. We, we we pushed all the horses up ahead. And we're in a tight pinch point. Passed out, and I got I got the hunter on video saying, "What are you doing to hunters you don't like, Steve?" <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, the horses got by us in the night. I took off as he normally would. Like they they're like, "Nah." As soon as the horses know you're going to the, the highway at the end of the season, they know. They're like, right. "Oh yeah, they're baby," done. and here they are, like, "Uh uh-uh, uh, f you guys." So we wake up in the morning with Mark's like, I'm the Wrangler. I'm like, what? He goes, you got in here. You're the guy. Now I'm the Wrangler. I'm going to get the horses. And for all we know, he's going to have to go all the way back to the highway. Yeah. And then catch him. And then he's got to drag him back up, right? So now I, it's a blizzard. I got this dude. And then we got to go. We got to go about three miles to the head. And hopefully find a ram. And it's just hell. And then uh, here's a group of rams in the bottom, in the bottom, right in the drain, right there. Like nine, right ninety degrees in front of us. We're like, oh my god! And he wanted a black ram too, right? Okay. So I'm looking at it. I got this all on video. We're looking at it. There's a black ram. Oh, how big is it? Well, he's eight years old for sure, and he's only about an inch over the bridge. And there's a lot bigger rams in here. You know, when guys ask you, well, can you tell me he's thirty eight inches? Nope. I learned that a long time ago. You might want to try to sling your dick and tell him how big it is to the inch. And I know some guys that can do it, but if you're really confident, I can tell you what a 40 is. I can tell you what it is. But if you're a half with some of these guys, right. if you're a half inch off, it destroys everything. Right. It's such an amazing thing to witness. So, and it's just a ram. I go, <clears throat> you know what you're looking at. He's an inch over the bridge. He's eight. This is the first legal ram you've seen in 13 <laughs> days. This is probably going to be one of the most incredible memories of your hunting career. Or yeah. whatever you want to call it, right? I mean, what more can you ask for for an experience in life? 13 days of absolute insane hardcore hunting every day in the middle of nowhere. All these experiences, the lows, the highs, the everything. And it's coming down to a half an inch of sheep and horn? What? Anyway, but you don't realize this yet. And then uh, I said, well, can you tell me it's 37? Nope. <laughs> All I'm going to say is, you know what? He's eight years old. He's an inch over the bridge, and there's a lot bigger rams can be shot in here. Yeah. You know, I just found a legal ram. It's up to you. You want to pass? We're going to pass. And then as soon as they say, can we get a closer look at it? Then you know they're going to shoot it, right? You right, never, right. If it's a hammer, I'm to shoot it. Yeah. Shoot it. But it's up to you. It's up to you. It's just a ram. It's a black one, though. 
So he goes, let's get a little closer. We get up there. <laughs> We're laying down. I got the video camera going. He, he missed it clean. And after all this back, the backstory, you're just like, oh, geez. And you got to keep your emotions to yourself. They came back to the height of land again. They just started going out the ridge. They all came back again, full, full skyline broadside. Third one from the top, third from the top. Misses it again. They all take off and disappear again. You're like, oh my God. Look at, they came back again. I got it all on video. They came back again. He shot and missed again. <laughs> Right, and they're they're on an angle like this, head up, head up. How far are we shooting? Uh, 180. Oh my god! Experienced mountain hunter, sheep hunter, like hunter of the world. He missed again, but then I saw the bullet crank off a rock, which was in front of the ram and about two feet over him behind him. So I hit a rock. I'm like, aim for his cock and balls. He's like this. What? Aim for his cock and balls. Hurry up, just aim for his cock and balls to do it again pulled the trigger dumped him <sighs> yes right <laughs> we got the ram yeah so and now we're soaked i'm laying in snow we didn't have the gear back then that you got these days these are hallie hans and rubber or nothing and i don't know what happened i was soaked we had to cross the creek on foot <clears throat> seven times to get up there from the fat fire you know how cold it was so yeah. uh we go up there get the ram and i'm like you know what i don't have time for this we're gonna die of hypothermia for real I go, I'm going to cape it, I'll pack this part, and I'll go back up, I'll cut it all up, I'll get the meat tomorrow. It's as fast as I can do to make sure if it gets chewed on a bit, you know. Yep. So I get back, and we just start packing up, we got around the corner, and I look down, and here's three horses and a rider. Like, oh my God, yes. And my partner just got married too, right? So he just wanted to get home to his bride. Yep. And I went, hey, and I turned around to show the, the profile, and he's like, yes. We get back to camp. And we're drinking whiskey, a couple of them, and he pulls out Stanley. Ah. And he put Stanley on him. And Stanley said it was only 37 inches. And he goes, you said it was 38 inches. No, I didn't. <laughs> uh-huh. It's a beautiful round. He did not speak to us the whole ride out. <sighs> I went back up, got the rest of the ram, and the first thing in the morning while they packed up camp, rode yeah. back he didn't speak to us the whole way out to the highway, and he didn't speak to us once at the after party in the ranch house. No shit, eh? What? You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, you know, well, well, you know, I didn't even have to describe how sad that is, but that's yeah. the reality, man. Is a lot of these guys, he's not, he's probably, went, I don't even know what how, what he's going to talk about when he tells that story. How's he, how, what's his version going to be? I went on a shitty hunt and only saw one legal ram, and he told me he was 38 and he was 37. Is that all he's saying? I don't know. Because that character, that mind, the character flaw, I might call it, who knows how his brain registered that whole experience? I'll, I'll never know. But it's a sad part of, this is just a sad part of some human beings that you bring into your world of living at 100% and they don't get it. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a tough thing, tough thing to uh, witness. But it's not that common. But right. in certain groups, it is kind of common when you get up to that higher end. Yeah. Sling my dick, look at what I got, and you know? Yep. Yeah. So you got a ram yet? No. And that's actually a good transition to my next question. So been on three sheep hunts. Um seen sheep, couple couldn't find a legal one. Couple, you know, last year couldn't couldn't I decided to go with the bow last year and got sub a hundred twice, but couldn't couldn't close the deal. And I'd be interested. So we've talked about the guys who have the cash and maybe don't have the heart, but there's another group of guys, a better group of guys, our group of guys who got the heart, but don't have the cash. And that's probably, <laughs> that, that's the beauty of living in BC. I don't even know what it is. 40 bucks, 50 bucks, whatever that tag is. We're probably the only place in the world where literally you need like a couple tanks of gas, hundred bucks worth of food in your pack and a $40 tag. And you can hike in left off the highway and you're chasing stones, man. Arguably the one of the most sought after sheep in the world because you got to come here to kill them. And that's why they're 80 K because everybody's looking to finish their slam. And this is the only place you're going to come to do it. But what type of advice? Cause I almost think in a way access to information held me back in a way. Cause I was looking for the secret 
And I thought there was going to be some post on some forum or some guy was going to tell me some honey hole. And I kind of spent the first couple of years of my sheep hunting career chasing down red herrings, looking for that secret spot. And then the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, I, I just don't see this as, as being the answer. And now I'm trying to like back up and go, it might take me a couple of years and maybe I just got to start at one corner and keep covering ground till I work to another corner. But there's guys out there, they got the passion, they got the drive, but they don't come from hunting backgrounds. They don't have those family spots or those buddies that have taken rams. What type of advice, what pieces of advice would you give to those guys? They're not a wildlife biologist flying around a helicopter. <laughs> right. <deep>. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the number one piece of advice that I hold tr is true with all hunting is if you concentrate on mastering your spot, right. then you cut tags every single year. It doesn't matter the species, okay. right? So you have to be willing to dive into a place where you know there's some sheep running around yeah. and, and then you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and then you learn your spot. You learn when they're roughly going to be there. You learn how the weather affects them, where they should be coming from, where they're probably going to because rams are on tour all the time. We used to have, you know, I think I was the first human being ever to get a stone sheep on a trail camera, ever. Huh. I found, uh, post Because I finally got my very first trail camera. like, oh, my God, I'm going to leave this on top of the mountain. Can you imagine how crazy that must have been? It would have been like caveman coming across the fire for the first time. Yes, yes. <laughs> I mean, it's like, a camera? <laughs> no way. This is going to be crazy. And I put one on the on a lick on top of the mountain, and I put one on the valley bottom trail. It was amazing. But anyway, we did a, I don't know, I probably had... We we're trying to get the, I was trying to get the Gram Slam of Huntable Wild Rams on trail camera. Okay. I, I went into Alaska by myself in the Chugach, dumped a bunch of cameras up there. We we're down South US, all through BC. It was stupid. But what I did realize was, is those rams are on tour. Right. On stop. And a lot of, nobody says, well, you can find a ram on that hill. He'll be there next year. Sure, I've had, I've done that a few times. But I'll tell you right now, I've had cameras just past Muncho. And I've had cameras all the way past uh, the Rock Cut Summit, and I never had the same ram on the camera once. Right. It's just a steady stream. So when you know that, but I knew this before anyways, when you know that, you get in a spot where there's tons of guys. Everybody's already been in there. There's nothing in there, and they run around. You run around all the basins. You leave your stink everywhere. You don't. You go sit. Once you get to learn your spot, you can go sit there, make your camp, and just sit there and wait. They're coming. Right. They're coming. I don't know if you saw. I made a video. Of, I finally. I finally. So hard. To, like I said, making the videos. It's so hard to get your whole hunt on video. It's, yeah. I've only done it a few times where you went on your hunt, videotaped everything, and actually, actually harvested the animal on video. It's yeah. so freaking hard to Super do. Super hard. Yeah. It's hard to make yourself video. People yeah. don't realize how hard it is to make yourself use the camera. Like, yeah. you really have to force yourself to do it, you know? Especially when it comes down, they have, screw the camera. <laughs> you know, screw it. Let's just go. That's where I get the last three days. I'm all good. Like, if I'm going in for 10, I'm great for the first seven. And if there's not something on the ground by then, it's like, well, I get home to edit, and the last three days is, like, 45 <laughs> seconds. Because it's, like, <laughs> uh, like mission-focused, and it's, like, oh, I'll record shit later. I, it's funny how that drops off a cliff. Oh, yeah. But as an example, I don't know if you saw that hunt. I shot a 10-year-old ram, I think. And uh, I got all, I did perfect. I found this ramp and then uh, got up on there, put the site, set up the tripod. They're only 100 yards away from me. You know, normally you'd be like, oh my God, I just got to get this. I got to get the ramp. I was like, yeah. whatever. I got the tri set up the tripod. I got the camera on. I zoomed in. I'm like, this is beautiful. Thumped them. But, anyways, get the backstory on that particular ramp. If you saw the video, heavily hunted area right off the highway, right? We went in there, made camp, didn't move, just sat there. Sat there, and sat there, and sat there. Boom! There's five rams. Ten yard ram. Boom! Got him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So, so the getting back to the the ticket, the secret, the ultimate, the ultimate secret is mastering your spot, and that's why with all of my hunting, my black tails. Yeah. I've mastered that spot. If I could tell you how many days I hunted there without seeing a deer, <laughs> you'd think I was absolute insane for even. Still yep. doing it. Obviously, you've got some marbles missing because I'll see, getting back to Blacktail, my best spot ever. I might see 
I don't know. I might see a deer tomorrow when I go. Maybe. Probably not, but I might. But when I do, it's going to be a freaking hammer because I learned how to hunt my spot. I learned to know when game's coming through there, where they're probably going to go, where they're probably going to hang out, where they're going to bed, where the girls are going to go, where they're going to eat, and where they're going to bed, and what time of year. And more importantly for me, I realized that the genetics I found in this small pocket are off the freaking chart, which is the 10 leaf clover, <laughs> right? So when you, if you apply that to any game animal, learn your spot. And another thing in guiding, and I guide fishing too, hunting and guiding, the number one mistake that guarantees failure on average is when you start chasing the spots. Right. You start chasing the spots, you're going to lose. Right. You just, you are going to lose when you start chasing the spots. And I know sheep hunters, I've watched some of these videos on YouTube of guys going to sheep hunt. Oh man, we just did 180 kilometers. We went here, we went here, we went here, we went here, we went here. And they went to places that I know, uh, but not this year. And you're just like, oh God, you poor bastard. You probably walked by. You walked, you, I know they walked by so Jared, many. Jared, you, you're describing a half a dozen of my hunts. Like every mistake you're talking about is mistakes I've made. And I'm only now getting to the point like I would also bite off these huge areas. Like I get dropped off on one lake. All right, there's this other lake. It's about 42 kilometers away. If I go five kilometers and it's like, I would get home and I'd post a film and like an old timer would reach out. Nice guy. He's like, dude, just stop. <laughs> like why you were there. Like you needed to go up into one of those hanging basins and sit there for three days and just wait. But I think that, you know, we have as human beings, we have this thing called action bias. It feels better to take action because you think you're being more productive and you think you're going to be more successful. And as a hunter, I think arguably it's, it's more true, uh, the opposite. Like I think the more you can force yourself to sit and the more you can, cause that's the other thing that blows my mind about your blacktail spots. Like I know some of the areas near Pembry and, and, and Whistler roughly where you're going and like you're looking at huge areas on the side of the mountain, but like those little rut holes and those little pockets you're finding where you're reliably seeing those deer again and again and again are incredibly small. Like you could walk around up there a half a dozen times and never come across those little areas. So I think the amount of time that you got to sink into that spot to find those little patches, um, it's, it's not ridiculous. just, you don't just walk around for a day. And especially with the lack of sign blacktail leave, because everything is so lush and green and it like pops back up as soon as, I mean, you could literally be on a blacktail highway and you wouldn't even know it in half of that country. Cause it's either rocky or covered in, in moss. Like it just doesn't leave trails. Like when you're up North and seeing mule deer or, or other animals, like, yeah. yeah. Well, another thing with the blacktail too, if just for that, I mean, we're starting to go from sheep to blacktail, right? Which <laughs> is fine. But on that note, on quick note on the trail, a lot of their main trails are made in snow. Right. And then you wouldn't even know there's a trail there in the, in the, when there's no snow. Yep. But that golf, yeah. like I say, the amount of time and the, the areas that people overlook, like I'll tell you this one little tidbit. So I had this one spot for blacktail and it was, so this applies to all game. If you can take out of the story, the tip, you know what I mean? So I'm going up this spot with this dude years ago <clears throat> over there. And, uh, and it's thicker than shit. And he's like, ah, it's all grown up in here. It used to be good. Screw this. And I look at the ground and I saw this footprint and I'm like, oh. and he didn't see it and he didn't even take note of it. And I'm like, what? Right. And he's like, yeah, this place sucks. And I didn't say nothing. I'm like this. I'm going to find out who owns this. Are you kidding me? You know, even this dude doesn't even realize that that's like Tyrannosaurus Rex just stood here. And that's why I started hunting the spot. Too thick. It's never too thick. Yeah. So anyways, I started ruthlessly hunting this area. And the road was went up the mountain. Left side was thick, tangled dog shit. Right? Yep. And straight up. And there another road hot coming off to the right. Bill Bear spots is in clear cuts at the end. This is, a, this is fast forward over a handful of years learning a spot. Well, I would leave my truck. And I already had a whole pile of big bucks hanging off of me in the you know, people talking and my, I, I spent probably more time hiding my truck. From Dude, we used to talk about it at work. Cause I used to do layout and Squamish and all over the place and, and buddy would come to work and he's like, I think I saw Steve's truck the other day. <laughs> and we would talk about what road we thought you were on. Like, Oh, it was a deal. Like it was a big deal. If you thought you saw Steve's truck. Well, I used to call them truck chasers, right? Yeah. Well, I, 
Perks, like, because uh, there's a bunch of guys in Wilson. I always see, you know, local guys, and they're all talking about my truck, my truck, my truck. And yeah. meanwhile, I'm hunting BC, and I started that thread, follow the trophy block tail hunt, and I'll show you how to do it. Yeah. And you believe how many people, they didn't want to learn shit. I just going to no. find out where you're hunting. I'm like, yeah. you um, efforts, and it really gonna be fired up. I'm like, at the time, or people are shitting on me for shitting on truck chasers. So I'm like, no, you don't get it, man. I put in seven years in the spot, not one human being on the trail camera, and these guys are going to intentionally come and screw it. Because yeah. you will, with blacktails, you will screw it. Right. They get screwed. So anyway, uh, yeah, I spend more time. I, would, I used to borrow my buddy's wife's minivan and use that. I used to park my truck with the hood up, with the hood popped at some places I wanted to go scout. But I would, I used to, at this one spot, I parked my truck in the snow. And then I would literally leave in the dark, the opposite direction I'm hunting, up this other road, far enough on the road that I knew guys wouldn't, go that far on my tracks, I would jump in the forest and go back in the forest, jump from the forest into a truck track tire yeah. to hide my footprint, jump in the next one, and then jump in the timber to cross the road where I was hunting. I did that every day, <laughs> right? But get this one. That rut hole, my one of my main rut holes, was 75 yards in that wall of shit, and everybody drove by it every right. single day. And still today, not one person walked in there. Right. Isn't that crazy? And yeah. then you go through the rut hole, and then it went a steep cliff straight up. And I had that mountain to myself still today. I still got cameras there today, and I've never had a human being because I go up and over the top and then drop down through absolute hell straight down to get to this other the area. And that's where I've got all those cameras. And that's where a lot of those bucks have been posting lately on Instagram. That's where those guys were. Okay. They, st they still are. Nobody, go nobody goes in there. It's yeah. too hard, right? But anyways, what I'm saying, oh, no, getting back to the main point was learning your freaking area. <laughs> yeah. Right? You got to learn your area. Even if you think it sucks, it doesn't suck. You suck because you're not applying yourself and being patient and learning your spot. You're running around, running around and you're watching all these guys on Instagram and social media these days, posting up all your their big animals and you feel like you're a loser and you're, you're less or something, whatever it's making you feel and you got to catch up. When that's not shouldn't be part of it, but that's what's yeah. going on today, right? Social media is yep. You know another thing too. Social media it hasn't changed hunting. You can go. It's changed how we talk about hunting. It changes how we see hunting. It brings people's successes publicly in your face. But you know as well as like you go to those sheep mountains. The internet isn't out there. No. Facebook isn't sitting there in that valley with you. No. It doesn't change shit. You got different. You got different shit hanging off your body, as in gear and clothing and guns. Nothing's changed. <laughs> right. It's still the same deal out there in the woods. Once you get away from the screen, it's exactly the same out there. If you shut off the internet and never went on there ever again, and never watched all these posts and gotten sucked into whatever you're getting sucked in the line, it's still exactly the same game out there. It doesn't change. It will not change. It's just like the mountains you're in. They're exact same they were thousands of years ago. But anyway, learning your spot the sheep hunting, chasing it, and that looking for that that secret tip that's going to make you successful. It's not going to happen. You have to be able to make yourself go through failure again and again and again and not quit. And you, you know as well as I do. What do you get when you quit? doesn't matter what is in life. You get nothing. So no sniveling, no poo-poo, poor me, I'm not doing that again. You go. You go get kicked in the face again. You go get kicked in the face again. The boxer, how many times a boxer get punched in the face before he finally wins that belt? <laughs> right? Yeah. A lot. You got to go get kicked in the face nonstop and get up and go back out there. And then uh, as soon as, and I'm proof, as soon as you figure out how to hunt that spot, you're going to cut tags. And then right. you're going to learn your <clears throat> genetics and you're going to learn your potential and you're going to know whether or not you should take that 130 inch four point or you're going to let them go because you know there's probably a 150 160 running around here and for me i'm all over that i'm all over that ghost and i'm going to share this t one more tip right now for people who might be curious but this one man that changed my game is a wildlife biologist from the state stet edmonds passed away great guy and he got hired on by some of these gazillionaires who had all these huge ranches, and they hired him on to change the antler sizes and get their antler scores up on their herd and shit. He's a very knowledgeable man. And you're sitting with these guys for 10 to 14 days straight. Oh, hold on a second. What are you chewing on? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So anyways, uh, 
he explained to me, he says, hey, Steve, you know, because you're, you're with these guys side by side every single day. He goes, you know, uh, you know, you get in those places where there's beer bottles everywhere and fire pits and partying and bullet shells and shit. And I go, yeah, yeah. You think there's no game around there? I go, yeah. He goes, there is. What do you mean? Because, you know, when you get in an area and everybody says it's been shot out, you know, it's been shot out. There's nothing left. Everybody shot the shit out. It's all shot out. You know, see anything ever? And I go, yeah. He goes, they're still there. He goes, now listen to me. This is what he said to me. This is what changed my game. And this is why I got all these block tails, especially. He said, in all species, there is always going to be that two or three that are too smart for us to see. Right. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah. So you can't shoot out. He goes, no, human beings cannot shoot out all of the game. Well, sure, if it's in the desert or something, maybe, or helicopters, but we're talking just take British Columbia, whatever, forested yeah. mountain, Rocky Mountains. And so when he said that to me, I started hunting as though there was that ridiculous monster living around me in here somewhere that I'm not going to see him. And right. that's how I started. That's what I started hunting for. And the next thing you know, I started getting them <laughs> in the same area where I never even would have thought for a million years. So and that's when we start, like I said, and that's, and then I eventually came. I remember when I finally putting all the knowledge together and we were, I remember I was actually on the executive board of the Permanent Wildlife Association, all my friends there. And, and once I started to figure it out and I knew it was living in this one zone, I'm like, I'm going to get the largest black tail that anybody's ever registered to, or ever. Mark my words. I know it's going to happen because I could tell by the sheds I was finding and the, and the, yeah. and the bucks that I was, I was seeing and, and figuring out. And then it finally happened and I found them, but it took a long time. Another thing too, is I'll get back to that too, about finding that monster. Another tip I got to relay quick is with these huge, huge black tails, like that one, you know, you get 150, 160 inch black tail. My spots, my spots aren't full of those bucks, those bucks. Right. It's like when the stars and the planets and everything lines up right. And that right doe breeds with the right buck. Right. And then four or five, six, seven years later, here's this thing that makes you freaking pee your pants. Like, oh my God. So these bucks I'm getting, they only show up maybe once every four or five years. That's that size. You know, right. they're not, they're all, I don't, I'm not finding them all the time. I'd have them on trail cameras nonstop, but two or three of the biggest, stupidest, biggest black tails I ever came across. I got them on trail camera and I bounced the arrow off the biggest one. <laughs> but anyway, whatever. I still got them on video though. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but that doesn't happen that often, that class of buck. That's that's a lot of luck. A lot of luck for you, but more so a lot of luck for that right doe to find the right buck and pull right. that off. So just letting people know, you can't it's when you get to that that size, like I'm after I'm always trying to just find the most I'm trying to freak myself out even more. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, I'll bet there's no way there's got to be one way bigger than this. I'll bet you there is. And you know, and that's enough to keep you going. We're getting off track. What are we talking about? No, no, man. This is this is totally on track. And yeah. uh, we could go on about this all day, but I'd like to transition to one more topic before we wrap up. And hopefully you'll agree to come back on in the future because I think we could, there's a million things I would love to pick your brain yeah. about. I love bear hunting. And one of the things I love most about one of the shifts I've seen in the last seven, eight years is the increase of popularity in bear hunting. It's, they're not the hardest thing to hunt. So for the newer folks, I think it's a great animal to cut your teeth on. They're fun. It's one of the only hunts where I can just let myself go. I don't stress out over bear like I do over antlered creatures. It's just, I love it. And they're also a predator. So I'm helping out the ungulates at the same time. But one of the areas where I have failed as a hunter and where I think a lot of my peers are failing is in other forms of predator control, especially us down here in the lower mainland. It's not like I can just, you know, drive around the corner and go hunt wolves. I would love for you to share some insights about, you know, things that we could do or how can we better help or ways we could get into that because wolves is another thing that doesn't always have to be you know, everybody's always looking to hunt year round. And the thing is there's, you know, the fall season is chalked up with lots of great things that you can chase. But the nice thing about predators is you start extending your season into these other times of the year when you can't necessarily hunt. And just selfishly, 
I would love to get some advice, like where for a non wolf hunter who's never hunted a wolf in his life, where what's a good starting point? Ice, <laughs> ice and wintering zones. And there's there's <clears throat> ice and wintering zones are basically in every valley. You know, once right. you get up out of the valley a little bit, they're there. So you have to just f- figure out where everything's wintering. Find some ice, you're gonna find the wolves. <laughs> and oh man, it, so what you, you're not asking me about bears. You asking me about wolves? Asking about wolves. Yeah. When you got some bear knowledge, drop it. I ain't gonna turn it down. But yes. Yeah. Um, wolves, man. There was a big top guy. Obviously, if you followed my shit online, there. Yes. Go off for for months about that. But for me. Um, I mean, there, there's always going to be wolves. Number one, we don't hate wolves. Some people hate wolves. Ranchers yeah. hate wolves because they annihilate their income. You can't generate more hate than that, right? Yeah. You're taking if you can't survive in your backyard of the ranch, but um, you, you, I don't hate wolves. I don't hate wolves, but I do know for 100% fact, humans, 100% of all humans, are absolutely guilty of creating shit piles of wolves. Yes. <laughs> That's all there is to it. In a discussion, so. Um, it's various areas in BC are going to have a wolf, a true wolf problem. You know, some guys will see a pack of wolves. We got wolves everywhere. <laughs> we got a wolf problem. When you might not, but for the most part, if for for a mainland hunter to go find a wolf and kill it, the uh oh, shit, what's going on? Oh, the screen just went blank. My phone is ringing. Are you still there? Yep, still here. That's Sometimes weird. if your phone rings, it'll just uh, it'll blank it out from your end. I'm gonna turn the sucker off. Hold on a second. Yeah, I don't need that shit. There you go. Uh, yeah, if you want to get a wolf, you're gonna have to go up into the mountains. The closest place, I don't know. I mean, should I give? I could give places up, but then again, with that, is that gonna start a tsunami of guys going up? Yeah, there? we don't need to be. We want DYM one when we get off. I'll, I'll take it, but we don't need to be posting that <laughs> for everybody. But yeah, we want to go to your favorite hunting spot, and if you've got a favorite hunting spot, you've already know that they're where you've seen where you have seen wolf sign. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. So when you get that established, then you probably know as well where the game's gonna winter. Yep. That's what the wolves are going to be. Now, if you can find ice, which wolves absolutely love and thrive on, then you got then you're going to have yourself a wolf hunt, and it's a guarantee. You need the colder it is, okay, when it's really really cold, that's when they're really going to be on the ice. So, early spring starting to warm up, but they're still ice. Nah, they're probably on the ice, you know. But it's a little warmer out. You probably get them on the ice, but freezing freaking cold at first light. Go the length of that ice, or if you got a bait pile better, you're gonna get your wolf, right? And then you can go into more, more intimate tips, I guess. You know, calling them in, knowing where to call them in, baiting them, starting a bait pile, and doing it that way. But if it's just a day trip you're looking at, or a weekend trip, because you know what, baiting, believe me, I've baited wolves, and it sometimes they won't. It 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 can sometimes it can take. Okay, I drug I drug a a steer farmer gave to me up the Pemberton Valley. So big, I barely got up there on my sled, and I just left it right in the middle of the road. There you go. And uh, and it was like two weeks. You know, bobcats are going up there, the coyotes are sniffing around. Two weeks, whole pack of wolves finally goes past that steer after two weeks, and they both split on both sides of it and kept on going. Didn't even stop to sniff it, right? Huh. One week later, they came back. They almost ate everything. Huh. <laughs> right? But I'm just sharing that tip as... I got tons of guys go, hey, we got this carcass. We're going to go up to Goldbridge or we're going to go up to the Fraser River and we're going to throw a bait out and try to get something off of it. I'm like, yeah, good luck. Right? If you think you're going to take a bucket of bait, throw it on the ground for a weekend hunt and get a wolf, nah, nah, don't even try it. You know, you need a bait. A, there's some outfitters. I know outfitters. They've got established bait piles that they've been feeding for years. Right. Once you can get it established, then you're going to have consistent success off that bait pile. But if it's like you say, you're, you're a guy who just wants to get in and you, and you want to go find a wolf, you're going to have to go up when it's freaking cold. When they start to rut, breed is right about now, well, February, March, more March. You go in March and then they're really running around because they're in heat, right? And they're really right. giving it. That's a real good time to find a wolf. But you got to go up in those valleys where you deer or moose hunt. You already know there's wolves there and find your nearest ice and hunt it for first light on the coldest days of the year. And that's the basically your easiest tip I can give for guys that are limited on time going from the lower mainland. That's your best route. 
right? And what about calling? Where where would you start learning how to how to call? Do you like mechanical mm-hmm. calls, like uh, the speaker things? Do you voice call? Like, what's some general tips around, or even some good resources people should be looking at for learning on a call? Well, they've they've got a lot of electronic calls now, uh, but I, we always just use our mouth. We just just we howl. Do, yeah, and there's it's always a two tone cow a two tone howl. That's all they do. Ooh, right? They got that two tone howl. Okay. And once you get them to uh, reply, you mimic the loudest, boldest call that you're getting back to you. Then just kind of like m- challenging with elk. Yeah, but you want to you going to mimic that call tone right. everything. There's the wolf. That's the wolf call I want to learn how to do. Is that one? Okay. And you okay. start mimicking him, and you cut him off, show him no respect, and they're coming. But another thing too is if you get them coming with your voice, there's almost I've seen over the years is almost like a natural barrier of about a hundred yards. As soon as they get to a hundred yards, on average, they stop dead. That's when they know. Oh, oh yeah, something's off. Yeah. So if, if they stop at a hundred. Don't do it anymore. <laughs> They've already know, and they won't. That's when they shut up. So if you, another thing too, you got him coming in, and he's 150, I want to get him a little closer. You better take the shot now. Right, right. Better do it now. Another thing too, I don't know, this might be a little graphic. I got some tips about the shooting part that we should probably do offline. That'll sure. Bump. Yeah, we'll do that later. But Yeah, so that's about the quickest, easiest tips is for the guys down here. Unless you're really motivated, you're going to pick a spot, and you guys are going to go up. And start that bait pile after the bears go to bed. Right. Strictly feed the wolves in that one spot where you know you can sit and pop them. Start your bait pile. You guys make a weekend trip and go up and go camp and have beers and feed your bait pile. And just, it all goes down just like learning your spot, right? right. The more time yeah. you spend. Yeah. There's no shortcuts, can- man. It's taken me so fucking long to figure that. Like, the problem is I'm a pretty smart guy. So I normally think I can like outsmart shit. <laughs> the older I'm 45 now, the older I've got, the more I realized there's no outsmarting anything like time and consistency kills, kills in yeah. business, kills in hunting, kills in everything, your relationships, your fitness, everything. The mm-hmm. only thing that wins consistently is doing the same thing again and again and again, you know, and building up. And it's so, it just pisses me off, man. Cause I feel like I wasted <laughs> years you know, doing all this scatterbrained shit when really like I've been living in, in, in and around Vancouver for the last 15 years, you know how many spots I could have by now, but I've been running all over hell's half acre trying to find the secret spots. And there is no fucking secret spots. Like anyways, anyways, we're, um, I'm now I'm running in circles, but I like hearing crap. that message again and again and again, because I think what's, that's what that newcomer needs to hear like learn that spot and do that thing there's no magic pill that's just going to produce cut tags it's just time and effort yeah and you got to have it in you to be able to get up and walk again after getting kicked in the nuts yeah if you're going to kick the nuts and go home and snivel about it and not do that again well you're not going to get good at anything i think that's why i'm glad i started with blacktail because there is no more ass kicking animal like when I say that, that first year I took my blacktail, I had over 30 days and that was the only living deer in the flesh I had seen in 30 days. And you watch these YouTube videos and they don't see anything after the first day or two and they're all starting to whine. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like <laughs> try going 30 days without seeing a single target animal, you know, they're around, but, um, and now. So then when I get into chasing other animals, it's like, yeah, man, I can go up on a hill and glass for four or five days. You don't see anything. It's like, I just keep grinding. And I do think blacktail was the, what was what really gave me that ability because everything else compared to them is just easy. Yeah. Like easy. it's not easy, but you're going to see them. They're, they're around. Whereas like blacktail, it's this mind game, man, where it's like, I don't know, maybe they're here. Maybe they're not like, you don't get that visual confirmation that you do with other animals. They suck. Yeah. <laughs> but that's why they're so beautiful because when you yeah. actually take one in the right way, like still hunting through the thick and deep, like you, there's just nothing else like that on the, in, in the world, man. Yeah. So then the feeling you get, when you go through all that freaking hell, and then all of a sudden, there's a true, yeah. whatever blacktail, but I like to all say it now. There's this freaking monster standing looking at you. And it's like, how do you describe that feeling? Just the seeing it, it's like, oh my God, there yeah. it is. There's yeah. that freaking one in a million billion ghost is right there. It's happening. 
Like it's yeah. all that condensed feelings, anticipation. Everything is condensed into one tenth of a second realization. It's real. It's right there. You know, it's hard, hard to describe that feeling, but it's yeah. just like, oh, oh. <laughs> like, oh, no way. Yeah, it's, it's very, very exciting. When meanwhile, you know, I go up north and I hunt for myself by myself a lot now. And uh, I'm telling you right now, I know I'm going to get an elk this year. <laughs> I'm going to go sheep hunting. I'm going to go. I'm going to find a ram. I'm going to. I know I'm going to get a ram. Do I know I'm going to get a monster blacktail? Hell no. Yeah. I hope so. <laughs> Do you know? And there's nothing. There's no other game. Black bear. I'll go find a six pack of black bears by lunch tomorrow. Yeah. You know, wolf. I know where to go. I'll go pop a. I'm going to go dump a pack of wolves or trap or wherever. Black tailed deer. I have a freaking clue. I hope so. <laughs> you, you know, people say I, a friend of mine had the guide outfit area where I was where I was uh, hunting blacktail. He goes, "Oh, you can sell the blacktail hunts you want, man," because he's just doing black bears. And I'm like, I could have sold a million blacktail hunts. I would not want that pressure on my worst Damn. enemy. Could you imagine? I thought the same thing. I'm like, that's why you don't see anybody doing them. Not here. No, not real just, one. You know what I mean? Like, it's just way too, yeah, way too risky. Like your yeah. your your opportunity percentage is going to be in the tank and finding i just don't think you're going to find guys who are looking to do guided hunts that want to pay for that experience like you got to be a little messed up upstairs and and those are the kind of guys who want to do the diy thing they're not going to pay for that you know no no could you imagine, i could imagine okay i'm gonna fly out from texas I'm gonna, yeah I'm gonna and the hell like that's the other thing like hunting blacktail sucks it's normally <laughs> wet it's super steep it's like moose but worse you know what i mean like you know, yeah. I just got back from New Mexico and I didn't kill anything. And I was like, who, like, it was beautiful, man. Like you're in New yeah. Mexico, you're sitting on these mesas and glassing down into these plateaus. And it's like, it's beautiful. And like, it's, it's fun. Even when it's shitty, blacktail hunting is shitty. Even when it's fun. Yeah, it's shitty. <laughs> it's shitty, but it's fun. You it's know, great, man. It's, it's, it's great. Like, like I'm mentioned. fired up now. I almost, I took a couple of years off because I started working, you know, going out of town and trying to do mule steer, do mule deer stuff. And I still have a couple little areas in my back pocket that I wanted to explore more from a couple of years ago. And I think the one nice thing is with the lack of snow we've got this year, I think I'm going to be able to get up and in there and start running cams a lot earlier than I would have previous years. Right. Yeah. You know, on that note, I got to drop this other tip. Please and I learned this a long time ago, is where there is deer, like, you know, people say, oh, there's no big ones around here. You'd be lucky to get a fork. Yeah, bullshit. Trust me. And I would, I will bet everything, I put my life on this fact. Where there is deer, there is a hammer. Right. End O story. It's that simple. And a lot of people, what? Trust me. It's even right here I'm living right now. I got a, there's a smaller four points, been seen a handful of times, and there's, Buddy of mine's got 12 does in his yard nonstop. His wife feeds him grain all the time. Well, I've never seen a big buck here on his property, right? I'm like, they're here. There's going to be a monster here. There's no way there isn't a hammer mature monster black tail buck. Monster can vary, right? My idea right. of monster is a little extreme. But <laughs> I'm talking five-inch bases, lots of knurling, cranker, mon cranker mature eight-year-old buck. I'll guarantee you. There is one of those everywhere you know there's deer. Right. Guaranteed. And even and so Sarah, she's really familiar with the with the game, obviously now. And find every time I'm away somewhere. Like the past couple years, I decided to go chase mule deer, just gotta have them for a while. Mm -hmm. She goes, You wouldn't believe the buck I saw by the mailboxes. Oh, like, really? Well, describe to you. Well, it definitely had those four, four by four. But there was a couple extra ones too. And lots of bumps <laughs> around and lots of bumps by his eyeballs. And I'm like, I knew it, right? And then who see, who sees that thing again at nine o'clock in the morning this year, right? Yeah. That big one's there again. Holy shit! So of course, and I just started this year to throw down. I'm not I'm not interested in killing that deer here. I'm not interested at all because if I'm going to hunt blacktail, I'm going to my spot in the mainland. Yeah. Not a, you know this, but a sound, I'll bet you this buck might be 130 or something. Describing, which is a monster for the island, but 100 percent it is. But I'm good as, and it'd be fun that I made note of that buck right now. Because yeah. I got my buddy who has guided game and he guides fishing and he lives a five minute quad ride from me and he's got 12 does in his yard nonstop. I've never seen one that big around here. There you go. Right. Yeah. So I am just for the kick of it. I'm going to get that bastard on video camera. Yeah. I'm going to get him on trail camera too. And it also, 
I don't have to prove anything, but I know he's there. Before he moved here, and my buddy's telling me there's no big ones here. I'm like, no, yeah, there is. There is. So getting to you with your spot, like every time I come to Vancouver, I'm looking at those timbered hills above Vancouver, right? Yeah. And all I'm seeing is, oh, my God, I wonder how many monsters are dying of old age looking at the city. 100% there are. Everywhere. But yep. Everywhere. But they are there. You don't have to go, yeah. oh, well, freaking his doll's getting out up by uh, Whistler Squamish. You know, we've got to go out there. <laughs> Do you? No, you don't. You go to the first patch. You can believe if you can. It's a lot of my videos. You can hear traffic in my videos. Right. Because you can't get away from that highway sound of the sea of sky. No, I mean, I'm can't. way the frick up there, and you can still hear the damn traffic down there, and guys are thinking I'm right beside the highway. Yeah. I'm not. Whatever. I'm just saying, that whole Sea to Sky strip, they're up there. Yeah. They are up there. They're everywhere. They're not everywhere, but they're there, man. So you got to pick your hill, pick your chunk of timber. Does it, You don't have to go far from oh, Chilliwack, where you are. There's some big freaking deer around there, but I know, I think, those are mostly migratory too, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, and I'm right back in Vancouver now. So technically it's probably, I used to, I used to, we were in Vancouver for years. I used to hunt Squamish a lot. And then we moved to Fort uh, Langley. So I, I hunted Chilliwack quite a bit. And now we're we're back right in Vancouver again. So it's kind of six of one, half a dozen of the other, whether mm-hmm. I go to, out to the valley or, or head up Sea to Sky. I probably right. know Sea to Sky a bit better because I've done a bunch of layout up all those, you know, cut off roads that head up to the, to the right when you're, you know, oh, yeah. once you pass the golf course, like all that kind, you know, the mam quam and all the rest of them. Um, but yeah, there's, but I think that's the, 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 the big takeaway for me is like, don't look at the big area and try and find some magic pill, pick that hillside and get to know it and narrow down, you know, what their travel corridors are and where they're bedding. And, you know, that takes time, sometimes years. And that's the other thing it's finally take like, this is not a one year. I used to think it was a season game. Like, oh, I'm going to go kill a black tail in, in November. So I'll start hunting in November. And then you realize, oh, if I want to find a black tail in November, I actually got to start in July. And then you go out and you're like, oh, if I actually want to kill a mature black tail in November, I got to start in July three years before that, because I'm going to have to have cams around. I'm going to have to look at the data. I'm going to have to move them around. I'm going to have to find new hillsides. Like, your time horizon gets longer and longer and longer until you finally realize what it takes to narrow down these spots. Well, there's a lot of pressure today with your average yeah. human being. There's so much pressure, man. You got first, you got pressure of leaving home. Yep. You got pressure of the spending that money, especially in a family. You got pressure of leaving home, pressure of leaving work, pressure of spending money, pressure of time. You got a time limit, especially with Rams, right? Yep. I don't I'm going to sit around and wait. I'm not seeing anything. I got to get one. Yep. Like, I, I got to get so many days, only so much food. Oh my God, I got days run out. It cost me a lot of money. I got to get one. Well, yep. you're going to have to persevere and force yourself to sit on your ass and learn that spot. And it's a lot of pressure, right? It's a lot of pressure to, to throw down that time these days, especially today with the shit show going on. But yeah, I don't know. I, my best advice for a big block tail, you're just going to have to go pick your spot and how I pick a spot. There's some deer tracks. Got my spot. Right. <laughs> That's it. It's not hard. There's some deer tracks. There's deer here. For what I know, there's a mature buck here. If he's not here today, he will be right here. And then you, then you go from there. Yeah. And you find out where those does are hanging out. Find out where they're feeding, where they're bedding, if they're migrating, if they're not migrating. Where they're, and you stick to that spot and you don't see shit and you never see shit, but you will. You just can't quit. You have to learn that spot. And next no, here's an example of learning a spot. So this, I don't know if you saw, I got a pretty good buck this year. Yep. Black tail. And that was in my favorite spot. It was, I shot him about 200 yards from where I popped the arrow off the top of Zeus. Right. The yep. And number two, that great big non tip yep, number yep. two. All the same buck, same spot. And I know where they bed. I know where they feed. I know roughly when they should be there. I got home from, I went mule deer hunting. I got home and my gut's burning. I'm like, there's like, what was there? Four days left. And everything was perfect. And I'm like, I got to go. She's like, what? I got to go back to I got to go to my spot. I got to go. And I always have cameras there no matter what. And then I, I jump in the ferry. I ripped over there. I checked my cameras. And there's two pretty good bucks in there. But after you've seen 160 plus inch black tail, yeah. nothing's big anymore. <laughs> and I look at these two bucks. And there wasn't a deer on those trail cameras for a week. This just went dead, dead. And then it's the first week of December, right? 
And I'm like, hmm, they're higher. If there's if they're not there, I know I already know they're higher because right. I put in the time there. Yeah. I know that they're higher. So and all of a sudden I'm sitting there looking at my phone and the SD card reader, and all of a sudden a doe and a yearling are right in front of me, 12 yards in front of me. I'm like, holy shit. Right? Because you like to think you're on top of your awareness. And I'm like, oh, there's some bait. Perfect. But there wasn't anything on those cameras for a week. So obviously I'm thinking the ruts kind of turned down a bit, but I know where they're probably going to be. Right. So I left there, hiked all the way up, got my truck, drove up the mountain, hiked up the mountain onto this timbered knob, and there's one monster set of buck tracks coming down on the crust. Looked to be days old, and then one other is pretty fresh coming down again. I'm like, oh, there's one here. And then I know, I know, there's a big buck between me and down there in the bottom valley, and he's probably on top of this timbered knob. Because right. I already know that that's where the big bucks like to bed. And they go down below, they rut it up. Later in the day, they go up and they... So I started circling the knob. If I didn't push him up out of the bed, didn't see him. Here's a fresh bed in the frost with a monster buck track right there. All right, who's this? Right? I'm not overly freaked out because this number two wasn't on the camera. I think he's dead. Zeus is dead for sure. Last time I got him on video, there's a big black wolf going up his ass. Whatever. So I uh, I already and I started going down, straight down, and I don't want to go too far. <laughs> you know, it's like like oh god. Yep. I'm on my second hike of the day. The truck's going to be that way. Hopefully he's hooked up with a doe, maybe a few shelves down. Nope. And then he's stuck to the migration trail and he's going step for step. I'm like, oh no, he's going for it. Shit. Well, there's that doe and yearling way back there. See, it's all, and I, I hiked all the way back to the truck, got my truck, drove all the way around, bailed over the edge, all the way down to the big timber. And then, uh, but I, well, I chose to go halfway between him and where those does were because okay. I thought I was right behind him. So I cut into the timber. And I'm like, and there's hardly any tracks. And I'm looking around I'm like, God, this where's this damn trail? Like the migration trail. Yeah. That's saying, where's that damn trail? There it is. And there's that deer standing there in it. <laughs> about, he was like slight quarter to me, standing there looking at me at about 18 yards on the trail that I knew he was probably on walking down. And I knew if I had cut him off, I would probably get him. And if I didn't, he got past me already. I knew to go back to where the Dylan and the yearling were. Anyways, I got him. Yep. What I'm saying is, I already knew where, because there's no action down below, and because of pounding and pounding and pounding and learning that spot, if you're an average guy, you went over there and saw that spot where the cameras were, there wasn't a track on the trail. This place sucks, there's nothing here, and you leave. Right. Right? This place yep. sucks. Yep. I saw one doe. <laughs> Me? I got fresh bait. Right? Yeah. Oh, there's nothing here. They're higher. This is, there's a big difference. Yep. But in the same scene as some people who look at it, this place sucks. I haven't even been anything here in a week. This is stupid. There's nothing here. No, they're just higher. Go up higher. Went up higher. There he was. <laughs> right? And I already knew. Anyways, put it together. 140, whatever, 140 something inch buck. Gross. Scores a boon and crock of bucks. He's dead. Yep. I got him. The only reason I got him, because I knew what he was probably going to be doing in that area because of all the other years of watching the deer do the same thing. And he was only on that camera two times two weeks earlier so you can't you can't put all everything into trail cameras you got it you can't trail cameras help you yep. got to put your time into learning where they're going to travel where they're going to feed where they're going to bed i'm starting to repeat everything then but no it's good because any lesson you know worth hearing is worth hearing twice yeah listen sheep. man yeah go ahead yeah with sheep same thing yeah you, you can't, can't stress enough to uh, go to where it sucks. <laughs> right. Every single wicked place is going to suck. Right. It's probably going to, the best hunting spots ever probably suck eight days out of 10. Right. Right. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta keep going. You gotta keep, learn that spot. Like for you, man, I, I could, I could throw down just from the view of coming across in the ferry. I could yeah. pick out 25 wicked spots. I'm going to go, Hang on, that's my spot right there. I'm going to go in there. Find your deer track, one set of prints. Boom, I got a spot. There it is. You got your spot. And you're just going to start. Now you start getting kicked in the nuts every day for a while. <laughs> <laughs> right? Until it finally, finally comes to uh, fruit. Yeah. Listen, man, I want to thank you. I know podcasts aren't your your biggest thing in the world. And it meant a lot that you, uh, you hopped on today. And I'd love to do a, a round two at some point. But as we're kind of wrapping up, anything you want to you want to share, or tell people what's coming up, or I'll, obviously I'll post links to 
to all your socials and everything in the show notes, but floor is yours. If there's anything you want to say as we close out. I don't know. I think I'm, I, well, actually, you know, coincidentally, this is funny. Just this morning, I got an editor guy in the States and Texas, real good dude. And, uh, I just, I just decided to write a blacktail hunter book. <laughs> huh? Isn't that funny. Yeah. I just thought, uh, cause there isn't, you know, when I, there isn't much, nobody no. throws out that much stuff for blacktails and I did it. Yeah. I, I did it. And so it just, he just gave me my four cover proofs just this morning in the email. Kind of funny, but I'll make that. I'll let you know where that or where that's going to be when it's done. And I get it. It's going to be Please all glossy, glossy. So it's photographs in it, but I did it. I did it. Not a typical boring tip, how to hunt book. I did okay. it telling, I tell as many different stories as I can of I box with the picture of the box and what did I do and what did I learn and what led up to getting that book. That's why I did the whole book. Yeah. So that's coming out pretty quick. And then uh, my hunting apps, you know, here I'm, I'm like, I know nothing with technology, but when with apps, they change nonstop. Apple yeah. and Google, they change things. Then you got to get your tech geeks to do something new to them to make yep. them be able to play. And I'm, I'm just sifting through new tech geeks right now so they can reprogram to catch up. But I'm going to, I'm going to redo them because that was another, that could be a whole other topic. Be a fun uh, yeah. Topic. I, that was actually one of the things on my list to get into because I don't know if people understand the pioneer that you were in that area. Like now it's like, uh, you know, I can think of a dozen hunt app or like university kind of things, but like when the how to hunt app came out, like there was nothing else like that at the time. Like it was, that was a big deal, man. Well, I'll tell you what, we'll have a top, we'll have a talk about it offline. Yeah. Cause I got some stories that will make you freaking <laughs> bash your head into the wall with the frustration and what happened was, you know, I went, I was, I'll say it flat out. I was in the Yukon, one of the biggest names in the industry. Yeah. And I'll say it right now, I'll, I don't say anything to you. and say, and I haven't said it in his face, one of the biggest frauds I've ever come across. Right. So, and I left there with the, that was when I was like, how the hell I got to get rid of all this BS and I got to show people that they can do this too. And that you don't need this and that I need to show people true, honest knowledge. And that's how that ride started. Yeah. But it's an interesting long story. I'll share with you offline. We'll see if you want to share. You can record if you want. We'll see because there's a few things there that happened along the way where I had this thing. I had the guys that blew up Blue Lemon. I had all these people on my boat give me advice. And they said flat out, look, we looked into hunting and fishing industry. They're in the Stone Age. Yep. 100% they and are. I don't believe it. And I'm like, really go, you are probably seven years, six yep. to seven years ahead of everybody. Yep. And dude, 100%. I'm, in, I'm with the big wigs from Realtree and Mossy Oak. Yep. I got some stories. I got this item here. Loaded up with all your how tos, probably do. I don't know if we should even have this on the recording. Anyways, let's just say that when you come up with something like this and it's a tool, this is this is what I've hand created with a lot of money and I own it. Is it's it's like a so like a wild sheep convention twenty four seven. If you were to have it for your wild sheep organization, as a loose example, yeah. and the amount of people that were ego driven and didn't even have a clue what I was trying to deliver to them, yeah, what? And yeah, we'll talk about that later. It's a long, yeah. interesting, I'd love crazy. To. I'd ride. love to. I'm fascinated with it. But I'm at the point now. I'm going to uh, do something pretty big and significant with that platform because awesome. it is huge, right? Yeah, and, uh, it's really good. But I got to tell you, because I know you're business minded and you're a smart guy. When I tell you some of these stories, you're going to hit yourself in the face of the baseball bat out of frustration and go, you got to be kidding me. Oh, I bet, man. Oh, my 100%. God. 100%. Anyways, yeah, I'm going to redo that, but I don't need to promote. I'm good, man. I got, you know, I don't know why. I've never, even on the YouTube, I've never, ever once ever said, you know, I got three YouTube channels, I think. Never said like, subscribe, and share it once. And there's yeah. you know, seven to 10 million hits a month in that shit. People just. That's crazy, dude. Yeah, it's weird, man. It's like, well, you want to listen to an asshole like me talk? Okay, whatever. <laughs> But yeah, it's all good. I'm good. But I'll uh, I'll definitely we'll be talking again for sure, and I'll uh, I'll let you know about that Black Dillon book because you're Black yes. Dillon. You'll be into it. A hundred percent, man. I've just gotten back into books. I just finished Kurt Darner's original book on mule deer, and uh, I'm get you know I I think I get caught up in like the information age, and it's like to just sit down and hold a book and go back and forth between some tactics and a story and the pictures that they mix in, like. Um, slows things down a little bit. And I think as a general rule, that's not a bad thing to do with your life these days. Oh God. Books are, w books are way better than the internet, man. They can't yeah. be, they can't be, uh, deleted. Yeah. They're always sitting there on the coffee table in your face. Totally. And 
crack it open, right? And yeah. you can get somebody <laughs> and pass it off. Yeah, the books are great. And uh, I remember, I just remember being so freaked out happy when I saw one article on Blacktail Deer in Peter Susana magazine. Yeah. Oh my God, it's selling Blacktail, I'm buying it. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? There's just not too much shit out there for the passionate Blacktail hunter to put his hands on and, and uh, check it out. But yeah, I did it. Oh, that'll be great. All right, Steve. Thanks again, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you coming, having me come out. I'll do, we'll do it again for sure. I could probably talk for 10 years, but I love it, doing this stuff. There All we right, go. Man. Enjoy your day. You too, man. All talk right. To thanks, later. Steve. Cheers.